Hey, how you doing? Good. Why don't you have to sit back in the school for me? Uh, keep your hands out of your pockets. Oh, well. The next story was inspired by a creep who was caught on an undercover sting television show. This is no different from the other creeps who get caught in the operation, but what makes him stand out was his bizarre resemblance to the Simpsons character Bart Simpson. Here's a dramatized animation inspired by this individual. The story I'm about to tell is by far the most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me. I was just a kid at the time, but as a young teenager I thought I was much more mature than I actually was. My parents were leaving for the weekend to go visit some relatives who lived about four or five hours down the road in a rural part of the state. They had an acre of land and a huge house, so that was usually the place where reunions were planned. My parents wanted me to come, but to me, the thought of being stuck for three days in the middle of nowhere with all of my cousins, none of whom I was able to get along with, sounded like torture. I begged to stay, but it took a lot of back and forth to convince my parents that I was mature enough to be left alone at the house. My parents eventually caved and let me stay. I clearly remember the sternness in my mother's voice when she told me not to answer the door for anybody, for any reason, no matter what. Despite the abundance of caution my mother tried to give me, for the first few hours everything seemed fine. It wasn't until my parents texted me around nightfall that they arrived at the relative's house that the reality of the situation set in. That's when it hit me that my parents were a full four hour car ride away from me, and the darkness of the house after sundown was a lot more eerie than it ever seemed. I felt like I was in a cave. Every sound I heard outside sent chills down my spine. Every creak of a floorboard, every rustling of the leaves, they all gave me the sensation that I wasn't actually alone, even though that seemed totally irrational. To cover up my paranoid heightened sense of hearing, I turned on the TV and started watching my favorite show at the time, The Simpsons. My childhood cartoon gave me a sense of comfort and safety, until I heard several loud knocks coming from the front door. It was so loud I could feel the vibration through the floor. I froze and tried to pretend I didn't exist, hoping that whoever it was would just go away, but they wouldn't. The fear and panic within me simply continued to build as the relentless pounding at the door went on and on. Finally, I couldn't handle it anymore. I got to my feet and very slowly walked up to the door and cracked it open. Immediately the person on the other side tried to barge straight in, but they were held back by the chain lock that I had left latched. When they realized they couldn't get in, they crammed their face in the space between the door and the frame. I couldn't recognize who the man was, but he was old and creepy, especially in the way that his glossy eyes fixated on me in the dark. Hey little man, what's your name? Alex? What's yours? Would you let me in, Alex? I need to talk to your parents. Are they home? Why? Why do you need to talk to my parents? Oh, are they not here? You must be the man of the house then. It's okay, you can let me in. I'm your neighbor. I just need to borrow your lawnmower. It was in that moment that I finally realized that none of this was adding up, and that I'd made a mistake by even answering the door. I thought to myself, who mows their lawn in the middle of the night? I can't help you. Go ask someone else. I slammed the door shut and locked it up tight. He was no longer trying to beat down the door, so I thought I was in the clear. I went back to watching The Simpsons, and by about halfway through that episode, I was still on edge. I kept hearing the sound of tapping on the windows outside the living room, keeping me from getting too comfortable. No matter how hard I strained my eyes, I couldn't see anything on the other side of the glass. I told myself it was just the wind knocking a branch against the pane, but it didn't sit right with me. Hoping that a change of scenery would help calm me down before bed, I walked into the kitchen to get a late night glass of cold milk. I kept the lights off and found my way through the darkness with the ambient light of the TV, as I didn't want the man from earlier to see the lights on in my house and think I was still awake. For a few moments, it was silent. <gasps> but then the tapping returned as a loud banging on the glass right next to me. I jumped and spilled my glass of milk all over the kitchen tile. And then, I saw two hands press against the kitchen window. And there he was, the face of the same man from earlier smiling at me. I'd watched so much of The Simpsons that his face looked exactly like the face of Bart. Spiky hair and everything, except he looked more grotesque and uncanny. He smushed his nose against the glass and stared right at me. Hey, you kind of look like Millhouse. You want to hang out? Come on, it'd be fun. Just like on TV, the adventures of Bart and Millhouse. All you gotta do is let me in. Leave me alone or I'm calling the cops! I ran out of the kitchen and sprinted to my bedroom and locked the door. I was so shaken up I could barely think straight. I crawled under my bed and hid there, thinking he wouldn't be able to find me, but it didn't take long. I first heard his footsteps outside my window, and then his tapping once again. But this time it sounded different. It had gone from the muffled ticking of fingernails to the sharp playing of something hard like metal. I never looked, but it must have been a knife. Psst. 
Alex, you still there? Let me in. I just, just want to play. play. Open the door, Alex! I ran out from under my bed to grab the phone from the kitchen and call my parents. Mom, th there's a man outside the house and he won't leave me alone. Please come home! Unfortunately, there would have been no way for my parents to get home soon enough. My mom said she would call the cops and told me to hide until they arrived and to not make a sound. I listened to her every word and hung up the phone. I ran down the hallway and crawled under my bed. It was there that I waited for what felt like an eternity before the cops finally came. Of course, the creep was gone by then. There was no sign of him except for a crack on the kitchen window. I still don't want to think about what would have happened if he got in. Especially after I saw him a few months later on the TV. Except it wasn't on The Simpsons, but to catch a predator. Can we just get, get to what? What's your, what was your plan here tonight? I was just going to drink and hang out and watch some DVDs and that was it. The story was inspired by a clash at the legendary OVO Fest, which was a concert hosted by Drake every summer. Many artists, whether they are on tour or not, meet their fair share of flings, something Drake was especially known for. We figured we'd whip up a Drake nightmare fuel, cause why not? Here's what it looked like. For my own safety, I must remain anonymous. But even at the risk of being discovered, I need others to hear what I'm about to say. I used to have a celebrity crush on Drake, sort of. I say sort of because in reality it went far beyond the extent of most celebrity crushes. This all took place during the summer, a couple years back. I went to one of Drake's OVO concerts alone. I know way too many people here right now that I didn't know last year. Who the f*** are y'all? I don't usually go to festivals and concerts like this by myself, but this was a special occasion. I guess you could say I was planning on getting close to Drake the entire night, but it was all romantic lust. I had a ticket to the pit, and it took withstanding a lot of stairs and random hands on my body, but I succeeded in getting into the very front, right below the stage. There were some extremely forgettable opening acts before Drake got on stage, but once he appeared, things got electric. The concert itself was perfect as far as I was concerned. I'm sure everyone who was there had a great time, but none so intensely as I. Of course, I never took my eyes off him, and I made sure that no matter who was there with me leaning over the barriers and showing their cleavage, even if Beyonce herself had showed up, I would be the one who stood out among the crowd. I'd spent hours on my outfit, not to mention the days, months, and years I'd spent sculpting and perfecting my body on top of my genetic lottery. I was probably the hottest person in the arena, and all my work paid off in getting Drake's attention. The whole time he was performing, I could see him glancing over in my direction, giving me bedroom eyes in front of all those people, and even kneeling before my section at one point so we could get a better look at each other. Honestly, if the night had ended there, if the concert wrapped up and we all went home, it still would have been a legendary evening. I would have gone home with heightened Drake fever, and I would have continued to obsess over his music and image, but that's not the way things went. After the music stopped, I lingered at the barrier for a few minutes, catching my breath from all the action before attempting to make my way home. Then, something seemingly miraculous happened. One of Drake's personal bodyguards walked down the space between the crowd barrier and the stage, scanning all the faces that were there until he found mine. He then approached me and offered me the chance of a lifetime. Good evening, ma'am. You seem to have caught the star's eye. You've been offered access backstage to speak with him if you choose to accept. He didn't even have to say his name for me to know who he was talking about. Yes, I accept. Please take me to him. Follow me. The bodyguard took my hand and helped me over the barrier then led me through a maze of wires and scaffolding until we reached Drake's personal backstage room. Meeting his gaze was like a dream come true. Yeah, she's the one I saw. The sound of his voice gave me chills. Just then, the sea of bodyguards between me and him parted, and I nearly ran into his embrace. I was immediately wrapped in his arms as we fell onto a nearby couch and began to cuddle, unfazed by all the people surrounding us. This is so surreal. I can't believe it's really you. Want to know the biggest advantage to me performing so close to home? What's that, Drake? I get to take you home to my crib, where we can drop this entourage and really be alone together. That sounds divine, Zaddy. I mean, Drake, take me there. Just hold on. We're going home. I'm sure anyone can guess what happened after that. I won't get into the personal details, 
All you need to know is that the effect of his stardom did wear off, unfortunately. We slept together for a few hours, but I knew I had to show up back home at some point before sunrise, just in case my husband suspected any of my thought full acts. Drake was dead asleep, but I made so much noise getting dressed and collecting my things in the dark that I woke him up before I was able to slip out. Ah, where you going, boo? I'm sorry. I, I gotta go. Well, I've heard that before. Could I at least add you to my hotline bling? You really got me in my feelings. I'm really sorry, but I just can't do that. I'm married. Something about what I said really set him off. He started crawling up out of the sheets, growling like a dog. I better find your lovin'! I slipped through the doorway and slammed the door behind me. I then ran down the hallway to find my way out. But of course it wasn't gonna be that easy. Drake exploded out of the room behind me and immediately began to sprint down the hallway. The look I got on his face as I glanced over my shoulder was horrifying. He looked just as deranged as an incel threatening to go on a rampage. His eyes welling up with childish tears and his teeth bared like a rabid dog. And behind it all, supposedly, I never ran that fast in my life and I'll probably never run that fast again, unless my husband finds out about this. The layout of his mansion was like a maze of its own. There were so many twists and turns and corners that I tried to lose him with, but he knew every shortcut. Several times I thought I lost him just to have him appear right in front of me, forcing me to stop dead in my tracks and sprint in the other direction. Started from the bottom, now here! Leave me the hell alone, or I'm calling the cops! I knew I was about to run out of steam, but I couldn't let him get to me, so I ducked into a random room and locked the door behind me, then threw just about everything I could find in front of the door. Not even a minute later, I could hear Drake obliterating the door with a sledgehammer, plummeting through it till it was nothing but smithereens, with nowhere else to go. I was forced to lift open the window and jump down onto some soft, expensive-feeling grass. And from there, the rest of the escape was easy enough. All I had to do was slide underneath the front gate and then call a very expensive Uber to get home. I still think about that interaction to this day, and get reminded of it every time I hear him on the radio, or see him on the TV. Kiki, do you love me? Are you riding? Yum, 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 yum. Which one's going in the oven first? You. Mmm. Oven time. We just want to give a disclaimer that the next story is indeed fictional. But the ideology behind the way kitchens are run is a spectacle to be seen by none other than the iconic world-renowned Chef Ramsay. For any Hell's Kitchen or Master Chef fans, we wanted to stir up a nightmare fuel based on the experience most contestants have to deal with when competing for the grand prize. Of course, top with a disturbing twist. I used to work at the restaurant where they filmed Hell's Kitchen, although I was never present for the filming of any episodes myself. I only worked there for a short time, and I can attest to the fact that there's a reason I only managed to survive that gig for a few weeks. It literally is like hell with the amount of pressure and judgment that the staff is constantly under and for seemingly no reason other than the sadistic enjoyment of the customers. And that's without the oh-so-famous Gordon Ramsay even being there. Yeah, it might be his restaurant, but with all the other establishments that he owns, he's not usually there when the cameras aren't rolling. I remember quite clearly the day that the head honcho himself came to town for the first time. My first impression was that Gordon Ramsay in the kitchen was more or less the same as he was on television. Angry, vulgar, pushy, and wrinkly. The one thing out of this entire memory that makes me smile just a little bit were the wrinkles on his head. You've seen them on TV, but the cameras don't do it justice. There's a depth to them that you couldn't imagine, almost like he smuggles things through the folds. Not only that, when Gordon gets upset, his face gets fiery red and the wrinkles on the forehead seem to double in number. And that's what I remember the most, his tantrums. At the slightest mistake or mishap from anybody, he'd blow up on them and chew them out screaming in their faces in front of everybody. On the first day that Gordon was there managing us, I admit that the stress of the situation set off my nerves, and I made a mistake that I normally wouldn't have made. I was preparing a batch of salad dressing and the recipe called for paprika. I thought the bottle of reddish powder I reached for was the right one, but I was rushing because the great Gordon Ramsay was yelling at everyone about how slow we were. 
And as soon as I smelled that memory of Christmas, I knew that what I had dumped was cinnamon. There was no room for error in Hell's Kitchen. I would have to dump out the whole tub and restart the batch, and this setback would not go unnoticed. It was like he had a sixth sense for when Chef screwed up, and he was on me in an instant. Oh, come on! What the hell were you thinking? Are you completely daft? That bottle says cinnamon! Come on, say it with me now! Cinnamon! Not paprika, you dopey twat! I I'm sorry, Gordon. It won't happen again. What was that? I must not have heard you correctly. I was stricken with fear and could barely find my voice. And that's before he put a pocket knife to my neck, hidden from everyone else's sight by my collar. I still don't know where he pulled that out from. The best I can figure is that it was hidden in the folds of his forehead, and just by the looks of it, it legitimately looked like he could stash just about anything from how deep those crevices were. Now say it again. I'm sorry, Chef Gordon. It won't happen again, I promise. Good. That's what I thought. Now get back to it! I did my best to do so, and I stuck to my word and never let such a silly mistake happen again. Immediately I started counting down the hours until the old boss was back in charge. Just the rest of the night and then four more to finish out the week. It seemed like something I should have been able to handle. And by all accounts, I probably would have, had it not been for the sous chef. That poor fool. I don't know how someone with such a puppy-like temperament ends up in the literal kitchen of hell. But our new sous chef, who had just finished his two weeks of training under the other guy, was having the worst time out of all of us. Don't get me wrong, I like the guy. He was nice enough outside of work. He flopped around like a fish out of water and screwed up just about everything he handled. And the sole cause of his nervousness was nothing other than the overbearing presence of Chef Gordon. Because before we even got to the main course of the first night, the sous chef started making a habit of mistakes he had never made before. His name was Casey, by the way. It's worth remembering. Casey! Where the hell are you? Get over here right now! Look at this, Casey! What am I looking at? The, the salmon, Chef Gordon. I cooked it myself. I didn't ask for sushi, I asked for salmon! Um, it does look a little bit rare. I believe the order was for medium- It's raw! Not rare! It's completely raw! My apologies, Chef Gordon. It won't happen again. It better not, you wanker! We were all watching out of the corner of our eyes when Gordon threw the raw salmon plate at the wall shattering it into a thousand pieces. It caught us all by surprise, and unfortunately, it only got worse. It wasn't a salmon every single time, but just about every protein that was put in front of Casey, he managed to undercook, overcook, or in some way render it not fit for consumption by Chef Gordon's standards. And each time, Gordon got a little more unhinged. Casey, you screwed it up again! Uh, this is unbelievable! My grandma can cook better than you, and she's dead! Whoever thought you could be a chef needs to get their eyes checked! Disgusting! Pitiful! Raw, raw, raw! Look at what you've done, Casey! You cleaned out the entire freezer, and not one hungry customer has gotten their food yet! That's it! You're done! Get out! I stood there awestruck, watching Casey walk out with his tail between his legs. I tried my best to put my mind past the whole situation, but things weren't easier after that. Without our second in command, it had only taken three days for Gordon Ramsay to drive out a perfectly good chef, and I honestly wasn't sure if I could handle any more of the madness. Still, I went in for work the next day, and with no replacement for Casey, there was something different about everything. Chef Gordon called us all to attention at the beginning of the shift, and with the strangest of smiles stuck across his face. It is with great displeasure that I must inform you all. Chef Casey has been fired. But the good news is the freeze has been completely restocked thanks to a rush order from my personal butcher. The first thing I did after being released from that little roll call was check the freezer. I just had an itching curiosity. I opened a few of the packages and what I saw confounded me. The meat cuts didn't look like any piece of cow, chicken, lamb, or fish that I'd ever seen. They definitely weren't pork chops either but I didn't have time to make a thorough inspection. If you see something wrong, I'd be more than happy to fire you next. That won't be necessary, Chef. I kept quiet for the rest of the shift, but I didn't show up for work the next day, or any day afterward for that matter. I don't stay in contact with any of my old coworkers, and not because I'm afraid they'll be mad I know called no show on a Friday. It's because I'm afraid that if I stop running, my life might be in danger. I might end up getting stocked in a freezer. I've been working the Denny's graveyard shift for a couple years now, and I've seen my fair share of strange and stressful things during my time there, as I'm sure almost any Denny's employee can say. The location I work at is especially sketchy though, 
It's in a heavily rundown area where most of the buildings, including the Denny's, are in a significant state of disrepair. On top of that, the crime rate is pretty high. I'm quite used to getting robbed at gunpoint while working or seeing drive-bys and car chases go down on the street right outside the window. And of course, dealing with the obligatory regular crowd of rowdy trunks and loitering creeps. Unfortunately, the management is willfully negligent about the entire situation. My boss doesn't care at all about keeping up the face of the business, as in his words, nobody cares about a couple bad characters. People know what to expect when they come around here. I guess he's got a point about that because aside from me and him, the only other person who works the night shift is the one cook who doesn't care one bit about the quality of food he serves. With the sort of people I work around, I've gotten pretty good about keeping things cool. There's no such thing as security at Denny's, so I always try as hard as I can not to get confrontational with anyone. For instance, there was this one guy who randomly started coming in on a nightly basis. He was this frail old man who was unusually tall and cartoonishly thin. He was barely able to fold up his legs to fit in the booth. It's always hard to tell how much of an eater a customer is going to be, but this guy was definitely a surprise, as he looked like he hadn't eaten in years. Good evening, welcome to Denny's. Would you like to start with a drink or are you ready to order? Oh, I'm ready, Sonny. Give me the Grand Slam special. Are you sure? It's quite the bill if you don't finish the challenge. Never underestimate my appetite, Sonny. I could eat you and your entire family in a single sitting if I wanted to. Now go put in my order. Sure thing. I was caught off guard by his order. The Grand Slam is a corporate promotional menu item. Sort of a fusion of an all-you-can-eat buffet and an eating challenge. It's 20 full-size buttermilk pancakes split into two stacks of 10. And if you can eat all of them in 15 minutes or less, it's free. It's usually meant to be split between two people or even more. So whenever I see someone order it by themselves, I know they're about to fail. I've seen men 10 times that guy's size get close but never succeed. Personally, I can only eat three of those pancakes before I'm full. Any more and I start to feel sick. I can never imagine eating 20. You probably wouldn't believe it unless you saw it with your own eyes, but this guy put the challenge to shame. I set the food down on the table and walked back to the kitchen. I then watched with the cook from the kitchen as the skin and bone stick of a man picked up an entire stack of pancakes, unhinged his jaw, then stuffed all ten pancakes in his mouth and swallowed them without even chewing. The cook and I just looked at each other in absolute disbelief. But before we could even find words for what we'd just seen, the man was disappearing the other stack down his gullet all the same. Then, just like that, the old man, now with a distended belly, got up and walked out without paying a dime. He didn't even tip. My coworker and I immediately tried to relay this information to our boss, but he didn't believe us until he saw the security footage. What in the hell? How's that possible? Is there anything we can do about that? I had to make 20 whole pancakes and he didn't even taste a single one. Not officially. But if he keeps doing this, we'll have to get creative. What's that supposed to mean? Don't worry about it. Let us handle it. Keep that smiley face nice and ignorant. I really thought that such a feat was a fluke that could never be recreated, but to my surprise, the frail old man came back the very next day. And somehow, there was no way to tell that he'd eaten 20 pancakes the night before. The bulge in his belly was gone, and he looked as deathly thin as before. Welcome back, sir. What can I get you for tonight? Oh, come on, Sonny. We don't have to play this pointless game of manners, do we? You know what I want. <sighs> Let me guess. Another Grand Slam? That's it. And get used to it. I begrudgingly put the ticket up. And the cook, being one of those people who was adverse to work, looked absolutely pissed. I knew he was going to do something unsavory to the food, but I didn't want to know what. But at the same time, I really couldn't help myself from looking. What I saw wasn't very creative, but it was nasty. The cook hocked up a big ball of mucus and spat between every pancake in both stacks. I was honestly surprised by his boldness, but I guess if you're going to do something like that, you don't take half measures. After serving the man his food, the cook and I both watched from the kitchen once again. But this time, the cook was much more enthralled. I don't know what he was expecting, but the man ate all the pancakes in the exact same fashion as the previous night, in two inhumanely massive bites. The cook looked a little disappointed that the man hadn't tasted anything off about the pancakes, but I'm sure he didn't bother tasting them to begin with. This went on for a few weeks. Every single night, the skinniest man I've ever seen in my life would come in and put away 20 pancakes in about 30 seconds, mm -hmm. then come in the next night looking like it had all gone straight through him, like he had some kind of tapeworm living in his gut. That's when my boss noticed that the man would usually guzzle down an entire glass of water after finishing his food. And I think that's when the light bulb went off in his head. The next day, my boss forced me to get in on it. Hey, I need a penny from you. Don't ask why. Um, alright boss, I think I've got one. Here. A minute later, I saw the cook take the penny from my boss and sneak it in the stack. I thought they'd clean out their pockets for change and put a coin in between each one. 
I don't know what possessed them to be so childishly vindictive, but my co-workers were highly invested in trying to screw with this guy. But that's not even the worst of it. The cook powered off a gallon of pancake batter and made a special batch, adding in an exorbitant amount of baking soda to the mixture and stirring it in. The resulting pancakes were suspiciously puffy, but for some reason the customer paid no mind. I also watched my boss pour the man's glass of water, except he didn't use any water at all. He filled the entire glass with vinegar and perhaps another solvent I was unaware of. The customer must have had no sense of taste or smell, as the entire restaurant reeked of vinegar because of this. Then, all three of us eagerly watched to see the outcome. Two jaw-dropping bites, stuffing the pancakes down his throat, then a long guzzle to wash it all down. The man wiped his mouth and didn't even notice that anything was wrong. He started to get up and walk away, but then something stopped him. He groaned and began to clutch his stomach, which was ballooning in size far more than it ever had before. He started belching and foaming at the mouth, then keeled over trying to vomit. But all he could do was choke. Before long, his entire stomach was doubled in size. And then, he exploded. Blood and gut spewed in every direction. A hollowed out carcass of a man was all that was left behind. The blood mist got everywhere, and in all the carnage, I heard the rolling of a coin. I watched the penny spin and tumble to a stop. <gasps> and that's when I realized. I recognize that penny. The next story was inspired by the mugshot of this criminal you see here. At first glance, most would automatically pinpoint the similarities in comparison to the character Sideshow Bob from The Simpsons. Either way, the animation you're about to see displays a dramatized version of what landed him behind bars, or should I say, what got him this notorious mugshot. After drinking too much, I stayed at my friend's house for the night and decided to return home the following morning to prep myself for work. When I got back to my apartment, my legs were still a bit wobbly from all the alcohol I had last night. Then, upon reaching the door, I brought out the keys, but noticed that it was slightly open. I gently opened the door and entered the unit, where all of my things were in disarray. The TV was smashed, the sofa overturned, vases shattered, and the contents of my fridge coated the wooden floor panels, making it look like abstract art. Moments later, I heard a noise coming from the bedroom, and it sounded like people rummaging through my stuff. Hence, I crept as quietly as I could, wishing dearly that my hunch was wrong. However, as I peeked through the tiny hole, I stiffened at the sight of two men gathering cash from a small safe in my closet. So, instinctively, the first thing that came to mind was getting out of the apartment. As I took a step back, ready to run for it, the floor suddenly creaked, and the two guys standing in the room were now facing me with eerie clown masks. For a brief moment, we just stared at each other, my feet unable to move. What's wrong with me? I asked myself. Then, I soon realized that fear was like an anchor that kept me in place. Moments later, the culprit said, Run, you little sissy! And suddenly, my feet were back in motion. In the tight spaces of my small apartment unit, I could hear the guys guffaw as they rushed to capture me, with one of them saying, Don't let him get away! I threw beer glasses and drenched the wooden panels with water, hoping they would get themselves injured and buy me some time to escape. But unfortunately, they were undeterred, quickly getting up. As I desperately tried to open the door, they cussed incessantly. So, locking myself in the bathroom was my best option. When I got in, I crouched next to the tub, where I quivered, fearing for my life. And unfortunately, my phone's battery had died, leaving me at a dead end. Later on, I heard a loud banging on the door, but since I hadn't seen their faces, I tried to convince them to go away by saying, Look, I don't know who you guys are, but you can take the money and leave. However, to my horror, the banging didn't stop. In fact, it became much louder than before. Moments later, one of them successfully punctured a massive hole in the door with his head protruding. So, with his mask still on, he chortled and said, <laughs> Here's Johnny! Ah! 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 
I could hear his partner still banging on the door, until the only barrier I relied on unhinged itself and fell on the bathroom's tiled floor. Then, before I had any chance to defend myself, one of them grabbed my hair and hit my head on the porcelain tub, knocking me out cold. I didn't know how long I was unconscious for, but when I woke up, I had a blindfold over me, and the room smelled damp. As I lifted my head, one of them said, Hey Bob, look! He's finally awake! Then, he removed the blindfold in a split second, my eyes squinting at the light. Both my hands and feet were bound with metal chains and two locks, so I knew it would be difficult to make my escape. Moreover, even if I wanted to scream, it would be a futile attempt, due to having a tape over my mouth. As I surveyed the area, I could tell that I was in a basement with a window or a door as my only way out of here. A man stepped in front of me, wearing a black t-shirt, denim pants, and leather shoes. However, what was most striking about him were his dreadlocks hairstyle and the sinister presence he exuded. Well, 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 look who we have here, Bob said while slapping my face fondly. Please, please don't do this to me, please, I cried, begging for mercy. Then, Bob nodded to his accomplice, who pulled my head back and began waterboarding. No amount of words could describe the excruciating pain I was undergoing at the time. With a piece of cloth covering my face and breathing passages, a burning sensation spread across my immobilized body. Okay, here's the deal. Bob spoke again. Now. You took something from me, all right? And I don't like that very much. So if you could just tell me where it is... Wait a minute! You got the wrong guy! I didn't steal from anyone! I was waterboarded again. Then Bob said, Don't play dumb with me, you prick! Do you think I would let you live after what you've done? But I'm not the one you want! I swear, you have to believe me! Both Bob and his accomplice looked at each other, seemingly puzzled. Next, they looked into my phone and wallet to confirm my identity. Then, to my surprise, Bob unlocked the chains and told me that I was free to go. Something was terribly off, especially after seeing his malicious grin, but I didn't care much for that. I ran out the door anyway, never looking back. Then, moments later, Bob and his accomplice were scurrying after me, laughing boisterously as I dashed into the woods. <laughs> what the hell? I hollered as the two culprits advanced towards me. Then, unfortunately, they caught up to me and tied me to a tree upside down, picked up branches, and started hitting me repeatedly until they broke. When they left to get themselves other branches from a nearby bush, I quickly untied my feet. Then, as I fell to the ground, I immediately stood up and ran, unheeding the pain of broken bones. Hey, where'd he go? The accomplice said. Well, don't just stand there. Find him! Bob replied furiously. I hid in the bushes until night fell, blood dripping from my head. Then, as I gingerly crouched, I could hear the sound of footsteps nearby, where Bob kept saying, Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Come on out. Daddy wants to play. Biting my nails, I wished they would just disappear. So after seven agonizing hours, they finally quit and appeared to have left the area. But still anxious, I ran towards the riverbank. Then, seeing that the coast was clear, I called the cops. When they arrived, I explained everything that had happened and told them about Bob, who coincidentally looked like Sideshow Bob from the popular animated TV series The Simpsons. After getting my full statement at the station, they arrested Bob and his accomplice in a matter of two days. But since then, I decided to transfer to a nicer and smaller town, hoping I would not have to encounter another Sideshow Bob ever again. I'm not a cop, I swear! I've just never done this before. I'm a little out of my We just had our final exams, and after a grueling week of study and no play, I was itching to celebrate it with a friend. So after school, my mom dropped me and my friend Sam off at Disney World and told us to give her a call once we were done. As we entered the theme park, dancing lights and bright smiles surrounded us. I couldn't help but marvel at the magnificence of this kingdom. <gasps> when we laid our eyes on the dog whose elastic body carried jolly children as it strode along steel bars, we knew we wanted to go on the slinky dog dash. Swinging my hands in the air, I shouted, BEST DAY EVER! Sam, sitting next to me, was also screaming in sheer bliss. But 
As we left the platform, I had a nagging feeling that someone was watching me. I looked over my shoulder and amidst a sea of people, my line of sight caught a familiar figure standing erect in front of a candy store a few meters from where Sam and I were at. It was a mascot of a famous character that most children my age would instantly recognize. Disney's Mickey Mouse. I never had any qualms or phobia over mascots before. And in a theme park like Disney World, it's no surprise that we'd find a myriad of mascots frolicking the area to entertain zestful kids like Sam and I. So, why did I feel restless about this one? Well, for one thing, while all the other Disney characters were singing and dancing as they interacted with the visitors, Mickey Mouse was just standing there, his hands neatly tucked into his suit pockets, staring at me the entire time. Like a shadow overhead, I was clouded by uncertainty and anxiety. So at that moment, I diverted my attention. In the hours that passed, we were captivated by several other attractions such as the Triceratops Spin, the Barnstormer, Astro Orbiter, Tomorrowland Speedway, Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger Spin, and many more. We went on several spinning rides that made me want to puke. So me and Sam dropped by the food court, which made him anything but pleased. My mom just called and told me that I've only got an hour left before I have to head home. So pull yourself together and let's ride some more, you wimp, he said with a sullen look. Sam was my best friend because of our love for games and theme parks. However, I would sometimes be offended by his tone and treatment. So this time, I tried to speak my mind. Hey, you know, that wasn't very nice. He gazed at me, still glowering, and said, Yeah, yeah, whatever. Stop acting like you're in kindergarten and man up a little, okay? Come on, I reckon we can still go on two more rides. He took a sip of his drink and told me he had to go to the restroom. I sat there in the food court, drumming my fingers on the table feeling a bit irritated. Since I was looking down, I couldn't see if anyone was approaching me. Then, suddenly I heard the piercing sound of metal as the chair in front of me moved. Finally, you took so long! I stopped midway, realizing that it wasn't Sam, but a mascot sitting right in front of me. It was the same mascot I saw earlier, his eyes an endless void of darkness. Mickey, um, what are you doing here? I asked, fiddling with my fingers. A couple minutes passed and he remained silent making me very uncomfortable. So I said, Well, Mickey, thanks for joining me, but- Come with me, Tom. Uh -huh. I'll take you somewhere fun. Mickey finally spoke. Aghast, I stepped away from my chair and ran towards the restroom where I bumped into Sam. Hey, what's wrong with you? Why are you so fidgety all of a sudden? He asked, concerned and annoyed at the same time. Sam, there was a Mickey Mouse mascot earlier today. At first he was just gazing at me from afar, but now he asked me to come with him somewhere. Something's not right, dude. I finally told him. He looked at me, puzzled. Yeah, something's definitely wrong with you today. I mean, it's freaking Mickey Mouse, dude. Everybody loves him. I struggled to snap out of it and said, I, I don't know then. Let's just go for another ride. As we exited the platform, someone yanked me to the side. <gasps> when I turned to look, it was him, Mickey. His grip was firm and this time he said, Take me with you, Tom. Is that your friend over there? Trust me, Tom. He's a rotten egg. Instinctively, I backed away. But instead of scurrying, I asked him indignantly, How do you know my name? With a joyful yet sinister tone, he said, That doesn't matter, Tommy. What matters is that your friend is planning to get rid of you for good. And you won't let that happen, will you? That's not true! Stay away from me! I yelled as I ran away to meet up with Sam. Something didn't sit well with me at that moment. I felt the sudden urge to leave, but Sam insisted that we go on more rides. That's when I pitched the idea of taking an Uber to another local theme park that I searched on Google Maps. It took some convincing, but Sam eventually broke and followed suit. We ended up at a park called Icon and were immediately lined up at the first attraction that caught our eyes, the Drop Tower. I knew we'd have some of the best views from up there, but as we were lining up, I heard a voice behind me say, He's gonna kill you if you don't get to him first, Tommy! Looking back, I then saw Mickey hovering over me. I yelled, Leave me alone or I'm calling the cops! Infuriated, <laughs> Sam punched me on my shoulder and said, What the hell is wrong with you? Next time I'm coming back here with Ryan and Chuck, and you're not invited. Got all that? All guests, please begin aboarding the drop tower. I repeat, all guests, please begin aboarding the drop tower. I was seated between Sam and Mickey. As the ride rose to its peak, Mickey kept egging me on, saying, He's a bad kid, Tommy! Do it! Outraged, I replied, No, I can't! Do it! Now! Then, in a split second, I reached over and unbuckled Sam's seatbelt. <sighs> what the hell are you doing? I then grabbed Sam by his neck and pushed him off the ride. I watched him plummet from a height of 400 feet. Sam bellowed like he never had before. The next thing I knew, a pool of blood painted the pavement down below. Everyone let out a horrifying scream except for me. The staff rushed in, attempting to save him. Then, 
Mickey said. See, Tommy? That's how you man up. But when I looked next to me, Mickey had vanished. As I watched the commotion happen before my very eyes, my lips curled into a smile. But Come with me, Tom. Huh? I'll take you somewhere fun. The next story is loosely based on an incident that happened in a Bolingbroke, Illinois Denny's. The culprit in question is shown in the mugshot here. He went to celebrate his birthday at the Denny's with a friend after being heavily under the influence. But things went south real quick. Here's an animation inspired by the occurrence, with a large dose of nightmare fuel to go along with it. One night, two drunken men entered the restaurant. Of course, there was nothing wrong with them being drunk. I'm used to encountering people like that especially from 9 p.m. onwards. But something was unsettling about the way they were ogling me, especially the older guy who sent me a flying kiss and winked. I admit he was gross, but I let slide and approached them to ask about their orders. Moments later, the younger gentleman told his friend he had to take a piss, so when he left for the restroom, it was just me and the creepy old man whose lecherous stare made me feel like I should pass this on to another waitress. But to my dismay, the other waitress had her hands full, which meant I had no choice but to take this guy's order. Hi, what can I get you? I said with a neutral tone. Well, 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 fancy seeing you here. Weren't you that lady from Hooters I met a long time ago? He said, his entire body sluggish. Sorry, I'm not that girl. I've never worked at Hooters. I replied, annoyed that he evaded my query. Really? Oh, shockers. I thought for sure you were her because you're so damn f Tell you what. Then, he leaned in closer and said in a low tone. You can rest those f after bringing me my meal. What do you say? Once again, his eyes were ogling me. The best thing I could do was report him. However, since he didn't commit any physical harassment or attempt to do so, I had no solid evidence to support my claim if I ever decided to complain. So the only option I had was to get this over with. I won't ask you again. What is your order? I said callously. Whoa, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a f one over here. I love my f like that. Old men like me, if you know what I mean. He replied, licking his lips. Infuriated, I turned my back. However, as I took a step in the opposite direction, the old man suddenly grabbed my hand and said, Whoa, calm down, Miss Universe. You ain't gonna go without my order, are you? Let go of me, I said with intensity. Unfortunately, I still had to keep my voice down to avoid causing a scene. All right, easy now, he said in a semi-stupor as he chuckled triumphantly. Well, I'm not really familiar with Denny's, but I think I'll have a Grand Slam special. And oh, I want you to put a lot of cherry sauce on those pancakes. You got that, honey? <laughs> Night. <laughs> I took note of his request without making eye contact. Then, I immediately went back to the counter, where the cashier gazed at me with concerned eyes. Then, as I took a sidelong glance, I saw the old man shed tears. And from the looks of it, he seemed pretty sad. So at that moment, I began to feel sorry for him. And perhaps his personal issues were the main reason he decided to get drunk. <sighs> Poor guy. I told myself. As I brought him his meal, he gestured for me to sit next to him. And he wasn't as aggressive as he was earlier. Moments later, he said with a gloomy expression, Today's my birthday. I was supposed to celebrate it with my family. But since my wife and child don't want to see me anymore, I don't think I can afford to be happy. Looking down at my skirt, his words struck me hard. So, guilty for the way I felt earlier, I consented to his request and stupidly sat beside him. However, what happened next completely caught me off guard. Hey buddy, what took you so long? Did you destroy the toilet? We haven't even eaten yet! The old geezer's friend flumped beside me, immobilizing me as I sat helplessly between them. There was clearly an open space on the other side of the booth, so I knew something was up. This meant I was essentially sandwiched between two greasy drunks. I tried my best to remain calm, glancing nervously at my surroundings as I racked my brain for a way to escape. What's the matter, honey? You seem edgy all of a sudden, the old man said with a minatory grin. Yeah, there's nothing to worry about. We're just feeling a bit lonely tonight, that's all, the guy who came from the restroom added. I tried to make eye contact with the customers leaving the restaurant to ask for their help. From an outside perspective, it appeared as though we were having fun, as the men on both sides spoke to me casually. Therefore, since there was no threat or malice, other people in the restaurant, including the staff, quickly brushed me off. As the number of customers dwindled, the amount of pressure weighed on me even more. I wanted so badly to approach the chef. However, 
since I was sandwiched between two guys, it was risky to cry out for help. Who knew if they had pocket knives? They could easily stab me multiple times and I would be a goner for sure. Pinned between such awful men, I caught the strong scent of liquor and the foul odor of bodies that I hadn't bathed in days. It was disgusting to say the least, and I feared what they would do to me. Moments later, upon gazing at his pancakes, the old man suddenly threw a tantrum and exclaimed, Why is there no cherry sauce on this one? Then, glancing at me, he said, Didn't I specifically tell you to add tons of cherry sauce? Dude, it's not that time of the month yet. Look at her. Doesn't she seem perfect to get in my birthday suit? Hey, sharing is caring, you old hag. Not a moment sooner. Both guys wrapped their arms around my shoulders, creating the illusion we were pals, whispering smutty things that would forever traumatize me. Then, as the old man tore with my hair, he said, You know, since it's my birthday and all, why don't you feed me? My body trembled as I looked down at his plate and did as he asked. As soon as I brought the fork to his mouth, he enveloped my entire hand with his mouth like some kind of horse, caressing it as he sucked the piece of pancake clean away. Moments later, his friend pushed me to kiss the old man. However, I refused adamantly and claimed I had a boyfriend. Enraged, the creep yelled, But it's my birthday, not his! When it's his birthday, it'll be his turn! Got that? Having no choice, I eventually caved in. Then, I leaned in to give the creep a peck on the cheek. But as I did that, he forced me to make out with him. His friend began to egg us on, and the man held my head with an iron grip. As we made out, I felt a searing pain in my mouth. And then the old man bit my tongue. This torment brought me indescribable horrors as my mouth bled incessantly. I eventually broke free from his kiss of death as he laughed like a raving lunatic, eyes red with malice and blood oozing from his mouth, saying, There you go! Now I've got my chair sauce! <laughs> All that adrenaline gave me the strength to push his friend off the chair and run to the kitchen, where my colleagues immediately called the cops. Luckily, they were still there when the police arrived. However, since that night, I can never look at Denny's food the same way again and I avoid anything that has a chair. I used to think that lifeguarding was the perfect gig for me. I've always felt at home at the beach and helping people has long been a natural instinct of mine. It's easy work and the certification process for becoming a lifeguard is leagues easier than something like medical school. And let me be clear, the job comes with many perks. I get to live by the beach like I've always wanted to and I get paid to watch the waves all day, which is what I would want to be doing every day of my life anyway. Of course, there is some responsibility with it as well. Every once in a while I have to deal with a panicking drowning swimmer or a minor shark bite or a jellyfish sting but that's not even the worst part of the job. That's the kind of stuff I expected to deal with. What I didn't expect to deal with was the men, the old creepy men. I don't know how, but in all the days of my life I've spent at the beach, I never really noticed just how many nasty creeps prowl on the ocean shore just about every day. Don't get me wrong, I always knew they were out there, deep down, and I always knew they were stealing glances and staring through their sunglasses, but it never bothered me as long as they kept their distance. Now that I'm at the beach alone every day, the advances I have to curve are far more numerous than they've ever been. And what makes it worse is being on the lifeguard tower. It's about 10 feet off the ground with no cover except a big umbrella. It's designed to give me full visibility of my assigned stretch of beach, but the side effect of the design is that I'm basically on display for whoever wants to stare at me, at whatever part of me, and for however long they please. And of course, I can't just leave because I have a job to do. And unfortunately, I don't have the authority to kick anybody off the beach without calling the cops. The worst offender by far is a guy I don't even know the name of. I just call him Herbert. He comes out every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday without fail. He never gets in the water and he never lays down an umbrella or anything like that. All he does is sit in the sand right next to my tower and stare at all the girls in bikinis through his ridiculously wide sunglasses. And the worst part is, he's only one worn out speedo from being totally n- he comes to the beach with clothes on, but when he gets to a spot next to me, he strips down to his freakishly slim banana hammock, revealing his god-awful leathery hide, all the while staring at me. He pretends to be suntanning, but it's disgustingly obvious that he's been doing this sort of thing his whole life, because his entire body is more deeply bronzed than Patrick was in that one episode of Spongebob. He's old enough to be my great-grandpa, too, 
With so many wrinkles and callous crevices all over his body that make him look like he used to weigh 400 pounds, lost 200, then gained back another 50. But of course, old creeps like him are never self-aware, even when they're creeping on girls that could be in middle school. I tried to be nice when he talked to me, though, which was often. Unfortunately, all he did was take advantage of that kindness. It's really no wonder they made you the lifeguard. You sure are the crown jewel of this beach. Do you ever think you'll come down and associate with the common folk? Uh, putting me on a pedestal isn't going to get you anywhere, Herbert, but you can keep trying. I'm not putting you on a pedestal, darling. I'm trying to get you down from the one you're on so I can get somebody to rub some lotion on this old body of mine. And why would I do that? Because I'm a frail old man who hasn't been able to do it myself for at least 20 years. I mean, look at me. Do I look like I need any more sun damage? Won't you help an old man? <sighs> All right, you old fart. But I really hope somebody starts drowning in the middle of it. <laughs> Reluctantly, I climbed down from the tower and accepted the bottle of sun tanning lotion he handed me. I honestly can't believe the things I do out of kindness. He rolled over onto his stomach and I started on his back. As bad as his skin looked, it felt even worse. It was like his whole body was covered in low-grit sandpaper. Even though I was disgusted with myself and terrified that other people around us might see me doing it, I put on a strong face and did the deed. Your back is all good now, Herbert. You're welcome. Wait a second. <sighs> Will you get my chest as well? Ugh, <sighs> fine. His chest was covered in a thick mat of tangled body hair, all full of lint and crusted sweat and salt water. I couldn't bear to lather in it too much, so I stopped before I got too near the bulge in the speedo. That's good, darling. Thank you very much. You can get the rest in the bedroom later. Not a chance. Not one lonely little chance in the world. Behave yourself, Herbert. The following weekend, after realizing he could play on my natural instincts to help people, he was a lot more pushy. I've been working on my backstroke. Wanna see? He didn't even wait for me to say no. He just ran straight into the high tide and started flopping around like a fish. At first, I thought his backstroke form was terrible, but after a minute or so, I realized he wasn't even swimming. He looked like he was genuinely struggling to stay above the water. I recognized the ineffectual splashing and choke cries for help from the train. He was drowning. I stood up and blew my whistle, grabbed my flotation device, and jumped from the tower, running into the water and making a beeline for the old man. By the time I got to him, he was floating face down and motionless, which made it terrifically easy to wade in the shore. There, in the sand, I performed immediate life support while shouting for a bystander to call an ambulance. His heart was still beating, but he wasn't breathing. Not unusual for drowning victims, as their lungs are usually full of water. I heaved him up to try to perform the Heimlich maneuver, but he was too fat and heavy for me to do it effectively. So reluctantly, I resorted to mouth to mouth. His lips were dry and cracked, and his breath tasted like milk and cigarettes. After about the 10th breath of life, I started to lose hope a little bit. But that's when the true nature of this event was revealed to me. I felt him stirring as though he was regaining consciousness. But then his tongue started moving. He grabbed my face and started swirling his tongue inside my mouth. That's when I punched him in the gut to get him to release me, then slapped him across the face and left him lying there in the sand. <laughs> he was all smiles and giggles after that like he just achieved some great feat or something. Thankfully, all the bystanders that had been caught up in the excitement quickly realized what was going on and started muttering and cursing him out for me. Herbert, however, was unfazed. The very next day, he tried the same trick. My backstroke didn't go so well, did it? Well, I guess I'll try the breaststroke this time. I watched him run off gleefully, fully in the mindset that if he started to fake drown again, I was going to let him die and make a fool of himself. And sure enough, within a minute, he started flopping around like a fish out of water once again. This time, it looked like he was really trying to give off a convincing performance. Almost everybody on the beach at the time was part of the same crowd from the day before. Some of them gave me expectant looks, but I just shook my head. Eventually, old Mr. Herbert stopped moving and started floating face down again. But he never came to. He never gave up the act and blushed with embarrassment. And he never learned his lesson. A little while later, he washed up on shore like a beached whale, unconscious. He really must have been quite discouraged because nobody did a thing besides move their spots a little farther down the beach. It was a good day chilling in the sun and watching his body blow and get carried out to sea in the receding tide. I must say, my day-to-day -day experience as a lifeguard has improved immensely after old Mr. Herbert's disappearance. I'm trying to get you down from the one you're on so I can get somebody to rub some lotion on this old body of mine.
The next story was inspired by this odd footage taken by a customer at Victoria's Secret. Some weirdo allegedly sniffing items after being warned by fellow customers. We wanted to take a step further and recreate a nightmare-induced tale that you will never forget. Of course, topped with a twist as always. I used to be a rather frequent customer at Victoria's Secret. I liked buying stuff there because it was always a good time to surprise my boy toy at the time with flashy new bedroom attire. No other outlet at the mall sold anything nearly as flattering, and when my boyfriend could tell I was wearing something extra nice, I could tell that he was putting in a little extra effort, if you get where I'm going. Buying underwear from Victoria's Secret was like a little investment in more ways than one. We had a good thing going, me and that boy. This was back in that era of life where we used to sneak around to let it be part of the rush. We used to wait until we were sure his parents were asleep, then I'd sneak in through his window. After that, I'd show off my most recent Victoria's Secret purchase. I got pretty good at listening for the footsteps up the hallway, and then dashing under the bed or into the closet, and I got quite adept at climbing in and out through that window without making a sound. The only problem with our little routine was that things often got lost in the complexity of the whole shebang. I kept coming short on underwear, particularly the G-strings. I figured I was being hasty with my exits and leaving things behind on accident. Accident. Then again, I did sometimes leave behind an article or two for my boyfriend to remember me by if I knew we were going to be apart for a little while. But when I returned, those little mementos were invariably misplaced or forgotten about or otherwise lost. I tried not to be mad, but those things were expensive and I didn't want his parents to catch us because they found a lace bra under his dresser one time. But even if I was upset, I couldn't stay mad. What we had going was just too good. I wasn't playing him, but I would ask for money sometimes just to go to the mall and head straight for the Victoria's Secret. One night after work, I knew I would be heading over to his place later, so I definitely had to stop by the mall before it closed. The night before, he decided to help me pay for a few new special somethings, since it was getting close to my birthday, so I wanted to stock up on some G-strings and whatever else caught my eye. The Victoria's Secret was usually pretty empty and didn't get much business as I lived in a pretty conservative town that didn't much care for fun things like lingerie, but I'm sure I kept them in business. That night, it seemed like it was just me and the cashier. We definitely recognized each other, but I don't think we ever got each other's names. She was probably in her late 20s, early 30s, texting on her phone so much she didn't even bother to greet me as I entered. I walked right past her and headed for the fancy stuff. But that's when I realized that the cashier and I were actually not alone. He almost appeared out of nowhere, like he'd been hiding behind the displays. There was a creepy-looking older guy standing around in the store, staring at the G-strings with his face far too close to the mannequin's crotch. I immediately tried to divert my course, but it was too late. He was already following me. I stopped near the thongs and tried my best to give off the impression that I wasn't looking for a conversation, but it was of no use. He approached me and leaned in too close for comfort, giving me a good look at his wrinkly stubble, so close that I could hear the whistling in his nose as he smelled my perfume. Coming in for a last minute purchase? Uh, yeah. Are you the owner of the store? What kind of lingerie do you like to wear? Are you into G-strings? I really don't think that's any of your business. I'm just trying to find the best G-string to buy for my wife. Something to make her wrinkly old bottom look more like 99 when I met her. Similar to females like yourself. Here's a secret. I'd like to use my wife's G-strings as dental floss. Her skid mark. Okay, that's enough. Don't walk away. I still don't know what I should buy. Leave me the hell alone or I'm calling the cops! I was thoroughly disgusted by his persistence. I was glad enough to have gotten rid of him without him touching me or having to scream for help. So when I saw him leave the store, I figured he was gone and that it was safe enough to continue shopping. I spent a little while collecting some things to try on. Then I headed into the fitting room. Once I tried on the fourth set or so of bra and underwear, I felt something wet drip down on me. A chill shot through my body as I looked up and realized that that horrible creep was peering down at me from the next stall. 
<laughs> You've been watching me the entire time and drooling all over my body. I shrieked and started to frantically put my things together for a quick escape. All the while, that vile pig was laughing like a psychotic freak. <laughs> I <laughs> reached down and grabbed a hold of my hair, then started yanking on it like some kind of gorilla. It hurt like he was going to rip locks out of my scalp. You're not going anywhere! Snitches get stitches! Let go of me! I felt a short burst of bloodlust coat my senses, and I scratched and clawed deep into his arms, drawing blood and peeling the skin from the fat of his gross body. It was enough pain to get him to release me. I ran out in nothing but a bra and underwear, leaving all my belongings in the stall. I started screaming bloody murder, and for the first time all night, the cashier looked up from her phone as customers from out in the breezeway started to look in. Somebody call the cops! There's a creep in the fitting room! As I said this, we could all see him racing into the fitting room I'd been in. Instead of trying to get away, he fell to his knees and started rummaging through all the underwear I'd left in the floor, putting each G-string to his nose and inhaling so loud it could be heard from 30 feet away. He even put one over his head and began to suckle on it. I wish I could erase the image from my head. The mall security arrived pretty quickly and trapped him in the fitting room. Still, he didn't pay them any mind. Even when the cops arrived and slapped him in handcuffs and dragged him out of the store, there was only one thing he could be fixated on. Anything for a whiff, baby. I just love the way you smell. <laughs> Once I collected myself and put my clothes back on, then talked to the police, I got in my car and raced to my boyfriend's house. It wasn't late enough to go inside his house, but I needed to tell him what had happened. He agreed to meet me outside, but as I got there and stepped out of my car, I could tell that there was something wrong with him. He'd just gotten off of a phone call, but he was still half holding the phone near his ear with a stunned, crooked arm. He looked distraught. Babe, what happened? You look worse than me. It's... my dad. He just got arrested at Victoria's Secret in the mall down the road. I don't know how that boy came from that man's genetics, but I finally understood how I was really losing all those articles of underwear all this time. My boyfriend's dad had figured us out a long time ago, but instead of grounding his son like a sane person, he let us keep going so he could sneak in afterward and steal my underwear for whatever sick, twisted, demented kicks he was getting from his obsession with what I smelled like. And it probably goes without saying, but me and my little fling could never be together after that. Every time I saw him, all I could think about was that man he came from, and how he might one day turn into that same kind of monster. This story was inspired by a Drake face tattoo that went viral over a decade ago. Many people have seen the photograph, but don't know what allegedly went down afterward. Here's a dramatized animation of the occurrence. One day I met this customer, a young lady in her teen years wearing a gothic outfit. She had black lips, dark shaded eyeshadows, and a frizzy hairstyle. However, she seemed a bit worn out, her eyes straining red and I could only assume that it was due to sleep deprivation. In addition, her attire didn't seem to fit her at all. She was paunchy, yet she tried to dress herself up like the slim and gorgeous Willow Smith. The woman's eyes grew in anticipation as she said, I want the name Drake on my forehead. Nothing more, nothing less. Enraptured by the mere thought of having her favorite musician permanently inked on her face, she browsed through the pictures on her phone and showed me a particular pattern that she designed herself. My goodness, this lady came prepared. Although I admired her bold attitude and immense passion for Drake, I've had cases of customers regretting their choices in the past and was afraid that, perhaps, she was currently a bit too euphoric to realize that this could be a bad idea. 
So I tried my very best to be polite and considerate. Drumming my fingers on the table next to me, I said, Ma'am, that sounds like an excellent choice. Drake is one of the best artists there is today, but, uh... What do you mean, one of the best? He is the best! Don't you know he's the sixth god? She interrupted, her eyes obsessing over Drake's photos on her phone. Right, of course, but, uh... You see, I've had a couple of clients a few years back who wanted some of the most creative designs tattooed on their faces, but eventually regretted having them later on, so... So what? Her mood instantly leaned towards consternation. Are you saying that I'm going to regret this later? Do you think you know better than me? You're not my dad, okay? So stop acting like one! Sheesh! She put her phone back into her pocket, and with her arms akimbo, she said, Look here, you're not being paid to comment on your client's choices. You're being paid to give us what we want! Then, unable to control these intense emotions, she took some of the used needles from the sink and threw them furiously on the floor, like a little girl having tantrums. Oh well, here we go again. I would occasionally run into these types of customers, so I had gotten used to it already. However, I didn't want to be the person to say, I told you so, in a couple of weeks. Nonetheless, my motto at work was, the customer is always right, no matter how bizarre the request was. In the end, I succumbed to her adamant request and eventually gave her what she wanted. Using her preferred font style and font size, I began tattooing Drake's name on her forehead. I've tattooed many clients' faces before, but this tattoo definitely took the cake. Typically, face tattoos were always a sensitive spot to tattoo for any client, but this girl took it like a champ. As a matter of fact, during the entire session, she stared at me with a huge disturbing grin on her face, as if I was fulfilling some kind of demented Drake fantasy of hers. When the job was done, she didn't have the reaction I initially expected to see. Instead, she appeared downtrodden as she looked at her own reflection in the mirror. I instantly took a photo of her and she was taken aback. Then, disappointed, she said, What the hell was that for? I always take pictures of my customers, ma'am. It's part of my portfolio as a reference to help me improve my art. I suppose there isn't a law against that, is there? I retorted, infuriated by her negative response after complying with her request. You call this art? You sicken me! She hollered in agony. Then, she handed me the payment and barged out the door. The following day, I instantly regretted caving in, because when I turned on the TV to watch MTV, a man was interviewing Drake. They talked about a woman who had the artist's name permanently inked on her forehead, and they even displayed her photo on the screen. I was caught off guard. She must have posted it on social media to obviously complain about it and get sympathy from the Edisons while grabbing Drake's attention. But it wasn't her picture that aggravated me, though. Instead, it was the words that came out of Drake's mouth. <gasps> Pulling out a smirk and a condescending laugh, Drake told the interviewer, I feel so much love for the lady. I mean, that's pure love right there. I wish I could meet her to understand why. I feel her a hundred percent, and I just think she's incredible. It's love. It's crazy. It's surreal. But as for the tattoo artist, man, go to hell, dude. I mean, he's messed up. He should definitely lose his job. After watching that, I focused all my energy on seceding clients, hoping they wouldn't be as delirious and irrational as my last customer. Then, one day while I was attending to a client, a tall, muscular man entered the shop. He wore a plain black t-shirt, denim pants, and Nike rubber shoes. He came toward me and said, Hey you, do you know this woman? He lifted the same picture I saw on MTV, the look of disdain on a lady who wasn't even pretty. I nodded and replied, Yeah, I've seen her. Why? Then, surprisingly, he crumpled the picture in front of me and asked, Do you know the tattoo artist who did this to her? I gulped, my anxiety slowly growing. However, I didn't want anyone else to be accountable for what I did, and so, I raised my hand gingerly and replied, It's me. I'm that guy. The moment I said that I was the guy he was looking for, he lunged his fist at me without hesitation, and with the first hit, I was instantly thrown to the floor. Naturally, this scared off my client who ran out of the shop, leaving me alone with this belligerent stranger. With blood flowing from my head, I struggled to get back on my feet. Then, as I stood up, the man thrust his fist towards me again 
but this time hitting me simultaneously like this was a UFC match. Soon, I realized that this wasn't just a UFC match. It was a fight to the death. The way he attacked me didn't feel like he was there to leave a warning. Instead, he was there to actually kill me. I was bewildered and afraid. As I crawled towards the sink to get my hands on some needles that could help me defend myself, the man beat me to it first, grabbed a couple of used needles, stabbing me in the legs. Distracted by the pain, I clutched my legs as the man kicked me with brute force until I fell unconscious. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed with my pal Jack standing next to me. When I asked him who the stranger was, he told me that he suspected the goon of being connected to Drake. However, it was only an assumption. There was no way I could have him investigated to discover the truth because, well, he was Drake, and compared to him, I was a nobody. Yo, have you seen this picture? I have. What are your thoughts on it? I want to meet her and understand why what happened. That's cool though, like, I, I feel you 100%. That to me is like absolutely incredible. I don't know if you can see it, but this girl tattooed Drake on her forehead. The guy who tatted it is a f though. I will tell you that. I don't f with that guy. F you to that tat artist, by the way, because for real. And you should lose your job. And you should never do tattoos again. I don't f with you. But real though, I really, really like, I want to talk to this girl and understand it all, you know? I mean, it's crazy. It's surreal. I don't even want to look at it anymore. It was a hot summer day and I needed a breather. So one day, as we drove along the paved roads next to the sandy beaches of California, we came to a halt when we found a pretty deserted spot. There was, however, a resort further down the beach and a few evenly distanced cottage homes where we occasionally saw old couples wandering about on their verandas. And so, we parked nearby and put down our bags on one of the Nipa hut cottages that were free for the public to use. So, after swimming for some time, I went back to shore. Moments later, I heard someone whistle. Taking a sidelong glance, I noticed two charming young ladies who seemed to be around my age. They appeared to be waving at someone. So, I looked behind me to see their companions, but nobody else was there. That's when one of the girls caught my attention and said, Hey you, mind if we join you? Staring at their physique, I couldn't help but blush as they came closer. The girls must have noticed because they giggled as I averted my gaze. Sooner or later, Leo came to shore, approached me and said, Wow Ethan, you never told me we'd have such gorgeous company. Would you like to introduce them? I scratched my head as my mind went blank and replied, Well... Um, this is, uh... Actually, we just met. Hi, I'm Sandra. Pointing to her friend next to her, she added, And this is Courtney. Leo was pleased. It's nice to meet you. So, what are you two lovely young ladies doing on a deserted part of this beach? Sandra tilted her head and replied, Well, I'd like to ask you the same thing, mister. Oh, uh, where are my manners? I'm Leo, and this is... Before he had a chance to finish, Courtney said. Ethan, you called him by his name earlier. Cute name, by the way. After getting acquainted with one another, we put on our clothes and offered the lady some drinks. Aside from beer, Leo surprisingly brought a bottle of vodka and sunset rum. Courtney was a hard drinker. Her friend attempted to stop her, but she wouldn't listen. As we sang and danced to the tunes of Paramore on Spotify, I marveled at the full moon illuminating the skies, shedding dim light upon the shores of California. We were all tipsy at this point, lying on the sand, but Courtney was still zealous and full of energy. She was on her next shot when she suggested, Oh, I know. Why don't, Why don't we, we all go, go skinny dipping? dipping? Wouldn't, Wouldn't that, that be fun? fun? Woo! <laughs> However, the rest of us were so exhausted that we amiably declined the offer. She frowned and pouted like a child, saying, Fine, I'll, I'll go, go by, by myself. She began to strip off her swimwear, heading for the water. Then, for a moment, she glanced at me and said, And oh, if, if you, you ever change, change your mind, mind I'll, I'll be waiting. waiting. 
Moments later, Sandra tries calling her name, asking her to return to shore, but to our dismay, we were only greeted by the sounds of waves splashing and winds howling as the night grew colder. We all stood up, approaching the water as Sandra hollered, Courtney! Hey, this isn't funny! You hear me? Say something! After a while, there was still no response. Leo and I looked at each other, feeling anxious. This was an indication that something could be terribly wrong, and since we were the only people there, we had to act quickly. As Leo and I began descending into the water, we heard a frantic scream coming from the distance. It was Courtney, and she sounded like she was in trouble. So, we followed the direction of her voice and raced towards her. After ten grueling minutes of searching in the dark, we finally found her and brought her back to shore. Her body was now stiff, and her skin complexion went from glowing white to pale blue. I gasped, realizing that she was no longer breathing, her pupils fully dilated. This beguiling young lady, who moments ago was flirting with me, had just drowned and was now dead. Nonetheless, I tried to give her CPR, aware that the brain may have had seven minutes before completely shutting down. However, despite my best efforts, there was no sign of life. Panicking, Sandra said. What the hell? We should have just called 911. She went for her phone and started dialing when Leo replied. No, not yet. Don't make the call, you hear me? Just wait a minute. Bawling her eyes out, Sandra hollered. We don't have a minute, Leo. Gosh, what's wrong with you? Just trust me. We'll think of something, Leo said, not sounding very persuasive. Then, Leo turned to me, gripped my arm, and told me, If she calls the cops, we'll go to jail for public intoxication and possible manslaughter, Ethan. We can't let that happen. Distressed, I replied, What do you suggest we do, wise guy? We've done everything we could, okay? Suddenly, the look on Leo's face changed into something more sinister. Then, he said, No, Ethan, not everything. I was so afraid to ask, but I had to. What do you mean, Leo? We have to get rid of them, he replied, his posture showing clear signs of resolve. Don't be foolish, Leo. We're talking about killing someone here. I think it's better that we call the police. I slapped him on the cheek, hoping he'd come back to his senses. However, Leo did the complete opposite. He scampered towards Sandra, pushing her to the ground, and began bashing her head with a rock. <laughs> I watched in horror as Sandra screamed for help, her legs wriggling in pain. However, I just stood there, my mind hazy. Leo's eyes were full of bloodlust. He didn't stop until her body ceased to move. When the deed was done, Leo pulled my arm and demanded that I help him drag the bodies to the water to eradicate the evidence. It was past midnight and we drove off as if nothing had happened in silence. However, the blood stains on our clothes were a stark reminder of the day I assisted in the act of murder. Following this traumatic event, I never set foot on the beach ever again. The next story was inspired by this infamous mugshot that has surfaced the internet for quite some time. There are many memes on the internet regarding this mugshot for obvious reasons, but one meme that stands out the most was a correlating image of the criminal and the Simpsons character Cletus. Here's a dramatized version of what led him to receive this mugshot. This all started at a house party I was at with some friends of mine. It was Miami summertime, and everybody was getting lit at long last. The drinks were flowing freely, the music was loud, and the girls were stunning. We were all hanging out in someone's backyard around a nice fire pit where there were some obligatory marshmallows available for roasting. Despite all the drinks that were going around, the mood changed, and everybody was looking to get even more under the influence that night. There was some half-serious, half-inebriated talk about where to get the next party round of party favors, as you couldn't exactly go and grab it from the store. And it didn't seem like anybody had reliable connections. 
I personally didn't want to have any part in it, as I was living at my parents' house and couldn't get away with smelling like a skunk when I got home. I hadn't come out to the party just to get messed up anyway. I knew that a certain person was going to be there, a girl I knew from a class who I used to flirt with every now and then. I was really hoping I could get lucky with her that night, so when the party vibes died down a bit, I walked over and started talking to her. Hey, long time no see. Oh yeah? Did you miss me? Hell yeah. Wanna smash? I, I mean, I'm, I'm very smashed. <laughs> Had a lot to drink. What do you say we get out of here and go over to your place? Not so fast, lover boy. The night is still young. But you know, if you were to help liven things up around here, you might just earn your invitation. Well then, how can I help? The owner of this house says there's a man who hangs around at the store on the corner. We know he's got the good stuff, but we don't feel like dealing with him right now. You feel me? But if you were to go get it from him, you'd be the life of the party. How will I know it's him and not some other gas station freak? Trust me, you'll know it's him when you see him. He's Cletus. Cletus? Like, from The Simpsons? Yeah, he looks and acts just like him. Just look for the teeth. Now go and get the people what they need. I sped off towards the store before I could be accused of being a square. I was a little torn, as I never wanted to partake in that particular consumption to begin with, but of course, getting with my crush was more important than staying out of trouble. It was about a five minute walk to the store. As soon as I rounded the corner, I saw a shady looking man loitering by the storefront. From the dirt on his face and the snaggle teeth sticking out of his mouth, I knew he had to be the one they called Cletus. However, that made me no less nervous to go up and talk to him. I've never done a deal like that before and I was completely unprepared for it mentally. Despite that, I knew that I'd have to make the sacrifice to get what I wanted. Hey man, are you Cletus? Just by the way he reacted, I could tell things were already getting off on the wrong foot. He stood up straight and stepped towards me, posturing. The closer he got to me, the harder it was to take my eyes off his impossibly mangled teeth. Yeah, and who the hell are you? How do you know who I am? I, uh, some of my friends told me you were, uh, and, uh, what you provide. I'm the one they sent to buy for the party. Any chance I could get two for fifths? You're an undie, ain't you? You think you can fool me with that BS lingo? Get out of my face before I mess you up, little piglet! Hold on, man. I'm not a cop, I swear. I've just never done this before. I'm a little out of my element, you know? I was... I was just hoping you could help me out. If I make this purchase, I might get laid. Hmm. Alright, I believe you. You ain't no cop, but he's definitely an idiot. Turn out your pockets, mama's boy. Wait, what? I said, give me all you got! Come on, don't make me wait! My heart was pounding. I thought about running, but I was frozen stiff by the sight of that nasty knife. Even if it was just a pocket knife, I've never been threatened with one in my entire life. I reluctantly obeyed his commands and handed over my cell phone and wallet. Yeah, that's a smart decision. Don't go nowhere just yet. Let me see what you got. He pocketed my phone right away and then rummaged through my wallet. Something about what he found or didn't find made him upset. I didn't have any credit cards and I didn't have much cash. You telling me all you got is ten dollars? What did you think you was gonna buy with ten dollars? That ain't ever gonna be enough for a whole party. Wait. Something ain't right here. You've been lying to me. No, no, I swear I didn't know how much $10 would buy. That's all I had. Damn it. People like you make me sick. That's about when things hit worst case scenario. I breathed a sigh of relief as I watched him put the money into his pocket, thinking it was all over, but it wasn't. Right as I dropped my guard, he lunged at me and stabbed me in the stomach. It was a small blade, but it hurt like fire and lightning all at once, and he didn't stop at just one thrust of the knife. He held me in place by the throat and bared his rotten mangled teeth, growling like a rabid animal while he repeatedly plunged the blade into my abdomen in a fit of sudden, boiling rage, tearing hole after hole in my skin in a matter of seconds. Finally, I mustered the strength of fight or flight and punched him straight in the mouth. One of his front teeth flew straight out of his jaw and hit the concrete. 
He reeled in pain, blood spurting from his jaw. I took the moment to run away, fighting through the terrible pain and holding my stomach tightly to stop the bleeding. I feared that Cletus would follow, but he didn't for some reason. However, he did have one more thing to say. The least you could have done was pay for my dentist! I can't imagine what mixture of insanity and stupidity one must possess to act the way he did, but it's not for regular people to understand. The run back to the party felt a million times longer than the initial walk it felt, but I eventually made it back and got help from the people who were there. The police had no trouble recognizing his description and bringing him in. They dubbed him Dracula, given his violent tendencies, but I still think the name Cletus is far more fitting for his looks and personality. Jokes aside, I bear the scars of that incident to this day. The gashes in my stomach are constant reminders of what I went through. But if you're wondering if the whole thing scored me pity points with my crush, (sighs) just so you know, it definitely did. accused of stealing hundreds of dollars worth of underwear from Victoria's Secret, leading police on a wild ride. Several officers ended up injured, and the drama is all caught on camera. They say he's the man you see here in the surveillance video, grabbing and stuffing more than $500 worth of underwear into a bag in about 15 seconds. This is one of the most bizarre scenarios for anyone to be in. A shoplifter caught red-handed, and out of all places, Victoria's Secret. But what makes this story disturbing was the aftermath that came along with it. Unlike other heists, people would usually go for something more valuable. But in this case, the culprit gives valuable a whole new meaning. Here's what the story looked like. I'd seen all sorts of weird stuff at the mall, like the Easter Bunny Brawl, which was more or less a fight between a mascot and a customer, or a stampede of six white-tailed deer causing damage to a minivan, including some shattered windows. But as a cashier working in one of the branches of Victoria's Secret, I didn't think I would encounter something so bizarre that it would send police chasing after a guy. Every now and then, I would help my colleague rearrange some items at the store. While misplaced items weren't such a big deal, missing items were entirely different. One day, as I hung some new arrivals in the lingerie section, I noticed that tons of them had gone missing. At first, I simply shrugged it off, thinking that perhaps we had many female customers that day who all shared a common goal of wanting to satisfy their husbands. Now, I didn't mean to be stereotypical, but I couldn't help but think that way regarding lingerie. However, after seeing footage caught by a CCTV camera, I realized it was more serious than I thought. In the footage, I saw a man in a hoodie running his fingers across the displayed underwear, sniffing them and rubbing his face with them. Upon checking the timestamp, the video was taken at 2 o'clock p.m. on Monday, when most people were either at school or the office. Moments later, the creepy guy grabbed tons of lingerie as he constantly surveyed his surroundings, ensuring no one was watching him. Afterward, he stuffed them in a duffel bag and was on his merry way. What could I say? It wasn't my fault he got away with it. Victoria's Secret encompasses a large portion of the mall, making it difficult for staff members to keep track of everything. And so, to make life easier, we alerted the guy whose sole obligation was to maintain the safety of the store's personnel and items, the security guards. We gave them a heads up and asked them to tighten their safety measures by closely monitoring the store's parameters. However, as the days passed, neither the salespeople nor the guards noticed anything out of the ordinary. Did he suddenly change his strategy because he knew he was now under surveillance? This guy was like a pesky rodent. We didn't know when he'd drop by or which hole he'd pop out from. And so, the only thing we could do was to stay alert at all times. In the days that followed, I began to feel more relaxed again, seeing the threat had vanished into thin air. Then, one late night, as I was folding some clothes, I saw in the corner of my eyes a bizarre-looking man. He was a dude wearing sunglasses and a black leather jacket. Why is he wearing sunglasses at night? I thought to myself. It was easy to rule out that he was blind because he didn't have a cane or a walking stick to guide his steps. And so, I cautiously approached him and asked, Hi sir, how may I help you today? Rubbing his hands with a look of anxiety, he said, Um... 
Do you know where I can find the 4XL G-strings? Noticing that I was perplexed, he clarified. Well, it's not for me, of course. You see, my wife is being a lazy lard today, and we need it for my upcoming birthday. If you know what I mean, and, uh, I think you do. You know, I like my females extra juicy, like my steak. More cushion for the pushin'. Your dinner is what we eat for breakfast, and for dessert, I like to eat my wife's- Bert, please say no more. <laughs> He laughed at my face, or should I say at his own jokes, like some unhinged psycho, to which I responded. No need for the explanation, sir. I'm just making sure you find what you want. Yeah, I've already found what I want. Hell, I can't wait for my wife to try these on. This is going to be so hot. Big girl gonna look bad for daddy tonight. He replied in an ominous tone as he pursued the underwear collection on the wall. Daddy's coming to get ya. He added as he began to drool. I was somewhat reluctant to leaving the customer alone, thinking he might be deranged. However, the man took a sidelong glance and said, well, what the hell are you standing there for? Can't a man select his wife's lingerie in peace? Oh, right. Sorry, sir. If there was anything I always tried to avoid, it was engaging with a furious customer. Well, just holler if you need me, and please take your time. I'll be at the front counter. As I headed for my post, I heard the man immediately scurry away. Then, when I turned to look, he had a huge pile of G-strings wrapped around his arms. Stunned and afraid, I immediately yelled, for help as I chased after him. Hey! You! Stop right there! I responded like a cop, unyielding of the dangers involved when confronting a thief. No can do, lady! The man grunted as he toppled over large sections of clothes along the aisle, obstructing my path. As a result, I slipped on tile floors, hurting my knees. However, I remained persistent, eventually catching up to him. It was probably the farthest jump I had ever made in my entire life, and when I landed on him, every ounce of strength was dedicated to removing the underwear from his arm. Give them back, you freak! The cops are coming! I hollered as I pounded his face with my bare hands. Then, his eyes widened, pushing me back until he was the one on top of me, smothering me with one of the panties on my face as he chortled and said, Let go of my G-strings, lady! 4XL is too big for a skinny little brat like you! I gasped for air, gesturing for him to relinquish the items, but he seemed adamant about finishing me off. Where are the security guards when I need them? I asked myself as my consciousness slowly drifted away. Moments later, we heard people sprinting across the floor heading in our direction. So, without second thought, he immediately stood up and made a run for it. It took a while for me to get up, but once I did, I followed him to the parking lot as I constantly cried out for help. And as the culprit got into the car, two police officers arrived, intimidating the deranged man. One of them banged on the door and said, Get the hell out of the car! Then, the cop displayed his baton, intending to break the glass windows. From a distance, I could see the thief struggle to start the car, while the second officer attempted to do the same thing as his partner from the opposite side. Moments later, one of them entered the vehicle through the window, leading to the back seat. However, the car began to move, and the other officer was left injured on the pavement. I was asked to leave a statement at the police station, and later on, they caught the crook a couple blocks down and brought back the lingerie worth thousands of dollars. As I watched the news on my television, I found out this guy was socially dysfunctional, suffering from some kind of underwear fixation. He was never married. The story about his 4XL wife was fabricated and made up. Gladly, I was given a bonus after the incident, but I had been wary of customers ever since. Officer using a nightstick trying to knock out the glass of the getaway car for who they say is an underwear thief. He's in the backseat fighting with an undercover officer who was staking out a Victoria's Secret store in Oakland Mall in Troy after a string of recent thefts. Two other officers try to make the arrest, one using a taser, but it didn't really work on the guy. The officer with the nightstick makes it half inside the car when he gets knocked out and onto another car in the parking lot as the panty prowler is able to drive off while still fighting the undercover cop. Move! 
Move! The scuffle continues inside the car. The thieves rented Nissan Altima hit several parked cars. The officer is able to get the car to come to a stop a short time later along 14 Mile. No need for the explanation, sir. I'm just making sure you find what you want. Yeah. The next story was inspired by a bizarre case regarding a Drake stalker. Not much of the public knows about the case, but there's been ongoing lawsuits and restraining orders filed between the pair. I don't want to disclose too much specific details as I'll let the animation speak for itself. Here's a dramatized version of the alleged occurrence. I would usually partake in the annual OVO fest with other talented artists like Migos, Travis Scott, and The Weeknd. After the concert, a lady wearing checkered pants and a casual shirt with the name Drake approached me. She looked ordinary and harmless, so I didn't have any negative opinions about her. She simply came to me to ask for my autograph, which I gave her generously. However, the way her eyes twitched and her smile formed was quite unsettling. It sent chills down my spine. Later on, she held my hand, startling my co-rappers and me. Then she said, I finally get to meet you, but this isn't enough. I need to spend more time with you, Drake. I gently let go of her hand, putting mine in the deep pockets of my favorite leather pants, saying in an awkward tone, Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, thanks, I guess. Um, nice shirt, by the way. And your name is? Oh, yeah, you can call me Kitty. Actually, I live in New York City, but I'm ready to start from scratch here in Canada, especially now that we can be together. She replied flirtatiously, her eyes filled with desperation and passion. It was honestly starting to creep me out, so I kindly asked her to sit on a chair and wait for me. Then the next thing I did was call security to escort her out of the premises, but things only got worse after that. She became hysterical and went berserk. She began turning tables and chairs, ranting. I want to be with you, Drake. Why are you taking me away? I'm his hotline bling. When she was finally out of the building, my pals approached me and expressed their concern about the girl. They told me to contact the cops to execute a restraining order. However, disconcerting she may be, she hadn't caused my family nor me any actual harm. In fact, at some point, I even thought that she may have some kind of mental disorder, so I felt sympathy for the poor girl. In the end, I simply let it slide, and I quickly forgot about her. But days later, I began receiving email messages from a woman who said she knew everything about me and would do anything to get close to me. As proof, she indicated my favorite food, my type of lifestyle, where I went to high school, and other predictable personal stuff. But later on, when her messages started talking about what I did in the past couple of days with my family and close friends, which no one was supposed to know about, I was taken aback. To protect the identity of the individual involved, we'll call her Maria, but she was a total stranger to me, and so I left her with a warning. In my email message to her, I said, Stop sending me messages using any email service or social media. Do you understand? Just don't contact me anymore. I don't appreciate you peering into my private matters. Then, not even a minute later, I received another email coming from the same girl. This time, she sent me photos of herself posing erotically in different positions. But what made it even worse was that she held pictures of me in her selfie photos. It was disgusting. So, despite her being an avid fan or just a really strange groupie, the most logical thing was to block her email. And then, hours later, I received numerous emails from another account with the same message saying, Drake, I love you! How could you do this to me? Don't you dare block this email too. But if you do, I know where to find you. If that's not enough, I can also do horrible things to your little boy. You can't run away! I turned a blind eye and blocked this email too, so eventually she stopped sending me those pesky emails. As a precaution, I instructed my security team to double their efforts to keep my home and son safe from external forces that could wreak havoc. However, one day I got a call from security, telling me that someone had broken into my house in Los Angeles. Good thing I wasn't there at the time. 
but as I watched the surveillance footage sent to me, I shook my head in disgust and utter disappointment. In the video, I saw a woman creeping into the house through the kitchen window. She walked towards the fridge, took a couple of sodas and water bottles, brought them to my room, locked herself in, and laid her filthy body on my bed. She vexingly caressed my blanket as she drooled over my pillows, licking them afterward. Later on, she opened the cans of sodas and water bottles, consuming their content while watching television. Then, when she still wasn't satisfied, she slid the closet door open, took one of my hoodies and wore it as she danced and laughed deliriously. What I saw next gave me nightmares. She took a screwdriver from her pocket, stabbed my pillows on the bed, and started screaming. Jake! I want you, Jake! You got me in my feelings! She said as tears dripped down her psychotic face. Eventually, the guards found her, forcing her to leave my property. In the video, she adamantly claimed, Drake said I can stay here longer. You have no right to push me away. Seeing she had completely lost her mind, the guards called the cops and she was taken away as she struggled to break free from their grasp, saying, You regret this, Drake! You hear me? Afterward, I requested a restraining order against her. Then, later on, I received a call from my lawyer, telling me that someone had just sued me for $4 billion dollars. Soon, I discovered that she was charging me for using her name and damaging her reputation and product affirmations, rap music, and social media posts. But that wasn't all. My lawyer told me that she had spoken to the woman who had pressed charges against me. In their conversation, he said, Ma'am, do you realize that if we take this to court, the liabilities weigh heavily on your side? Then she replied, Is that a threat, Mr. Steen? Just because Drake is a huge star doesn't mean that he can get away with what he did. He's gonna pay! Miss, you do not have undeniable empirical evidence of him doing any of these things you claimed. Therefore, I kindly advise you to step back and walk away. You liar! I'm suing Drake whether you like it or not! She replied, hollering hysterically on the phone, nearly breaking my lawyer's eardrums. Afterwards, <gasps> she hung up on him. After speaking to my lawyer and reading posts on social media, I soon discovered that the woman was the same individual who sent me those disturbing email messages and photos. Then, it hit me. Suddenly, I remembered meeting an ardent fan in one of my concerts who called herself Kitty. I soon realized that she was the same woman who broke into my home, but after confirming that she was mentally incapacitated, I decided that no criminal charges should be filed against her. However, I became more vigilant after that, hoping there wouldn't be another crazy fan stalking me. Want to know the biggest advantage to me performing so close to home? What's that, Drake? I get to take it. <laughs> Despite however much I want it to be just a nightmare, the things that happened that day are unfortunately very real. The memories of what I saw haunt me even now, almost a decade on. You just can't forget something like that. No matter how many thousands of dollars you spend in therapy, nor how many nights you spend getting to the bottom of the bottle, believe me, I've tried everything. But all it seems to do is wash away everything but the dreadfully crystal clear memory of what I saw on that day. It was a beautiful day chock full of sunshine, a perfect day for the beach. Chances are almost every Australian in the country was either already at the shore or itching to get there. On that particular day, it was more crowded than usual. Still enough space for everyone to enjoy themselves, though. Plenty of sunbathing babes and their beer-chugging boyfriends, if they had them. Quite a handful of young families and their retiree grandparents. And many, many surfers out on the water, catching the plentiful waves rolling on through and crashing ashore. Truly, it was an unbeatable summer day. 
I couldn't resist getting into the water myself, of course, and even though I used to surf on occasion back then, I had a special toy to play with that day that I had recently just purchased. I'd never ridden a jet ski before, so I took it out past the surf and practiced the handling in the flatter waters for a little while. I remember somehow getting out of breath from the sheer exhilaration of it, and taking a moment out past the waves to myself to drift with the natural current of the water. But in any case, being that far from the shore and watching all the little people go about their leisure, it was an unmatched moment of serenity, with not a single sound but the gentle wind and the distant crashing of waves. Out of nowhere, the peace was shattered into a million hopeless pieces. The sound of a man's scream was distant, but traveled more than well enough across the water to seem terrifyingly close. All the people on the beach stopped and turned their heads out to sea. I scanned the crowd of surfers, and within a moment, I saw it. The man, being plunged and dragged below the water, still tied by the wrist to his surfboard which flailed disturbingly as it tried to remain buoyant. All around him, and growing fast, a zone of crimson which sent chills down my spine. I immediately started up the jet ski and raced to him full throttle. The surfers were all rushing to shore, abandoning the man to his fate. I got to take my jumps on the waves, but there was absolutely no joy in it whatsoever. When I got there, the man was clinging to his surfboard, crying out for a savior. Help me please! There's a shark! Take my hand! Climb on and I'll take you to shore! Frantically, he reached out and grabbed onto my outstretched hand. His was drenched in blood and gripped mine like a vice. But as I tried to pull him up onto the back of the jet ski, struggling with the lack of space and balance to get him on board, I saw the shark circling behind its prey in the murky cloud of bloody water surrounding us, just a few feet away. It was, without a doubt, a great white, and it had to be over 15 feet long, more than dwarfing my jet ski, which was puny in comparison. But it was not circling out of curiosity. It had not just taken a bite to get a taste. It was feeding. Just when I thought it had disappeared, it thrashed out of the water and took the surfer into its mouth at the waist. The scream he let out was indescribable. Ah! Help me, please! Help! The shark pulled at the man, trying to drag him down into the depths, but I resisted. The jet ski tipped to one side, and the man's head was almost beneath the water. His eyes locked on to me, his face in the most absolute agony possible. And just when I thought our grip was about to fail, he was released from the shark's grasp. The jet ski recoiled and rocked back, and the man flew up out of the water. But that's when I saw what had really happened. His legs were gone. He was nothing more than a torso now, and all the blood within him spewed out from his waist and tainted the water around us. And just as quickly, I watched the life leave his eyes, still locked onto mine. His grip on my hand waned until it had totally gone limp, and I knew in that moment that he had probably just died right before my eyes. Still, I wanted to do whatever I could, so I continued to try to get what was left of his body onto the back of the jet ski. Everything was wet with blood and water and hopelessly slippery, and my eyes were welling up with tears despite my best efforts to maintain my composure. The shock was getting to me. I was alone in the ocean at that point, with every possible person that might have been able to help me watching from the safety of the shore. But the shark wasn't done. It may have taken the man's legs and swallowed them in a single bite, but it was still hungry, and it wanted the rest. And I was in its way. It circled back around and ran into me. I felt the rough scaliness of its hide upon my leg, at the same time as the sickening sensation of the jet ski nearly capsizing from the force of the shark's move of intimidation. One side of my body dipped into the bloody water, and there, just below the surface, only a few inches away from my face, was the mouth of the shark, reaching in for another bite. Without thinking, I let go of the man's body and punched the jet ski into full throttle, racing it to shore. If ever in my life there was something I wanted to go back and change, I would regret that moment right there, when I, too, 
abandon that man to the jaws of the Great White. Every night before I sleep, if I manage to at all, I see the man's face frozen in fear, slipping into the depths as I rode away into safety without him. And of course, getting through the pandemonium of crying children and <gasps> screaming, grieving women. There were more of a different breed of sharks waiting for me. The reporters. I hadn't even had a moment to breathe and collect myself before they were in my face, pointing cameras and microphones at me, berating me with a thousand heartless questions. It was all I could do to not burst into tears on national television. It's been about eight or nine years since then, and this has been the first time I've actually been able to tell the whole story without shutting down. The only thing I want to say now is to that man's family that I'm so terribly sorry, and that I did everything I could without getting killed myself. But even then, if I could go back, I'd trade my life for his. The next story is a legendary tale that has surfaced the internet for a while now. A lot of you might have heard of quote unquote Mr. One Way. The video shown here doesn't seem like much has happened, but something eerily disturbing is happening before your very eyes. More context will be disclosed during and at the end of the story. Here's a bizarre, dramatized version of the occurrence. If you look into the history of the Disneyland theme park, you're bound to come across the legend of a Mr. One Way, a ghost who is bound to ride Space Mountain for eternity. I'm an inside perspective that's been missing for all these years. I just haven't been able to speak until now. I was recently laid off by Disney and after working with them for over 40 years and agreeing to go under their NDA, the crooks managed to find a way to swindle me out of my entire pension. Eventually, of course, he was fired, but even then, I wouldn't say he was a normal guy. Bob wasn't his real name either. I worked mechanical construction with him, where we were part of the team of engineers responsible for the construction, maintenance, and renovation of all the theme park's many rides. Back in the old days, it was a sweet gig, but even then, we all took it with about the same amount of enthusiasm as we would with any other job. Not Bob, though. Bob was different. Bob was a roller coaster enthusiast. He worked on the rides with the same attitude that I imagine a spoiled little kid would play with toy models. The man was a little psychotic, and I mean that seriously. But when we moved on from the carnival type rides to the real roller coasters, is when things became severe. The first coaster we ever worked on together was Space Mountain. For some reason, Space Mountain was special to Bob. He would never take breaks, and he expected us all to do the same. Hey, Bob, it's lunchtime. You come. There's no time to slack off! I'll come once this baby gets built! I can't work when I'm hungry, Bob. Neither should you. You're all just a bunch of slackers! You do not care about this ride like I do! You're just here for the money! Why don't you call Aladdin, go on his magic carpet, and get the hell out of my face?! The rest of the guys and I just brushed him off. At first, we didn't mind that he was picking up the slack, but then his passion became an obsession. None of us really talked about it, but I definitely noticed. When we left in the evening, he stayed behind just to finish up, and when we arrived in the morning, he was already there, slaving away. His only reason for visiting the break room was to make a whole pot of coffee, pour the entire thing into his thermos, then walk out. I figure it must have been around 20 cups of coffee every day. One day, I decided to arrive to work about 20 minutes early just to see what was up, and you wouldn't believe it, but I caught Bob sleeping in one of the ride cars. He was fully clothed and still holding his tools, like he'd been fighting the urge to sleep but had finally lost. I nudged his boot and he shot awake. His eyes were wild and bloodshot, and he immediately started back up on work like I'd cracked the whip at him. I tried to calm him down, but it was of no use. Bob, you know it's okay to sleep, right? Maybe you should go home tonight and recharge- This roller coaster ain't gonna build itself! Magic isn't real! Bob, calm down! Rome wasn't built in a day! You're starting to look a little crazy now! You see this right here? This car is like my baby boy, and this track, 
the bosom of my matronly wife. She gives birth and cares for my children. In return, I grease her gears, tighten her bolts, weld her joints, and most of all, I prepare our children for the responsibility of the life ahead of them. Are you gonna do that, Wilson? Okay. <laughs> no, Bobby, I'll, I'll leave all of that to you. You just, just remember to take care of yourself, okay? Up until then, I never understood the extent to which Bob had demented himself. Despite the sleep deprivation and the insanity, he was doing exceptional work. We ended up finishing the project a few months ahead of schedule because of Bob's extra effort. But that was not the end of Bob's obsession. He was assigned to work on the next roller coaster project, but he never showed up. He was caught several times riding Space Mountain with the park patrons instead of working. Eventually, of course, he was fired, but even though they revoked his free pass into the park, there were daily sightings of Bob in the line to Space Mountain. He probably dumped his life savings into park tickets. That, or he was using his knowledge of the park to sneak in illegally. One night, I got a call at 3 in the morning, and who else would be up at that hour but Bob? Dude, why the hell are you calling me at 3 in the morning? Well, well, I'm so glad you're up. I'm sorry to surprise you, but... I'm getting married! I've called all the guys and told them to come, but I want you to be the best man. Uh, okay. I'm really happy for you. When's the wedding? It's tonight, at the top of Space Mountain. Don't worry about ironing your tux, because I want the ceremony to take place on the ride itself. The wind will blow out all the wrinkles. Bob, I, I don't know if this is the best idea. Strictly speaking, none of us are allowed on site after working hours. Forget about that! I'm headed over there now. You better be there. I was reluctant to go, but I felt like I had to be there to make sure things didn't go any worse. I threw on my old tuxedo and drove anxiously to the park, using the employee entrance to get in there after hours. There, I met Bob at the start of the ride. Bob? How did you get in here? And where's the bride? You're looking right at her! <laughs> <sighs> Jeez, not more of this crap. Come on, Bob. Don't judge me, Will. None of the other guys showed up, so you'll have to do the ceremony, okay? Ceremony? I, I'm no reverend. It doesn't have to be official. All you have to say is I now pronounce you husband and wife. Uh, I now pronounce you husband and wife. There. Happy? All of a sudden, he was kissing the roller coaster, but not in a tasteful, modest way like at a proper wedding ceremony. It was like some hormonal teenagers going at it in a very objectionably immoral way. Lots of tongue drooling and moaning. Ugh, I couldn't take it anymore. Bob! Hey, cut it out! Sorry. We'll save it for the honeymoon. You're still the best man, though. Would you please join us on our final ride together as husband and wife? Fine, but then I'm leaving. <sighs> what the hell am I doing with my life? I climbed into the seat behind him. Then we blasted off and zoomed through the ride. The whole time I was thinking I was going to lose my job over this, but Bob was hooting and hollering and screaming like a little kid, even though he probably knew every twist and turn by heart. However, about halfway through, Bob's head and arms whipped back towards me. He was completely stiff and motionless while flailing around with the turbulence of the ride. As soon as we finished, I jumped out to see what was up with him, but I immediately recognized that he'd passed on. He was gone. I called park security and a whole parade of ambulances, police cars, and firefighters came through. I thought I was about to be accused of murder, but the death was ruled a heart attack, probably from his constant overuse of caffeine and his general instability. I expected it to come out on the news the next day, then the whole thing was swept under the rug, as Mr. Disney didn't want to harm the popularity of his newest attraction. I was put under non-disclosure, but even with my silence, the story got out that there was something unnatural even supernatural going on with Space Mountain at Disneyland. People swearing they'd met Bob in line and even rode with him, only for him to disappear. Even security footage showing his shadowy presence. Now, I've never been one to believe in that stuff, but in this case, I make an exception. There really is something unholy haunting that ride.
The next story was inspired by a Denny's incident that occurred around the Christmas holidays. They say the customer is always right, but in this case, the customer takes his stance to a whole new level. Here, you can see a mugshot of the alleged culprit. It's what he did that shocked the Denny staff members and customers. Here's a dramatized animation of what went down that one Christmas night at Denny's. Everybody knows about congested streets and vacation sprees in and out of the country during this time of year, but what I despised most about December here at Denny's were the staff members who had applied for time off a month ago and were now enjoying days of endless barbecue nights and spas with their families. The restaurant owner would always plead that I help him out during holidays, luring me in with promises of better incentives. So one day I had to attend to several customers simultaneously, while coordinating with my colleagues who was assigned to work in the kitchen. And this was probably the worst case scenario, because there were only two of us today. The other three staff members called in sick, so naturally we had several angry customers grumbling about the slow service. Hey, I've got a meeting at 10.30 a.m. Is there any way you can make my eggs faster? A guy in a suit said. This branch is the worst. You guys should close down instead. An old woman exclaimed. There wasn't enough time for me to take breaks in between, so this season was an endurance test for my colleague and me. Later on, a man with a crew-cut hairstyle and freckled face approached the counter. His eyebrows furrowed as he drummed his fingers impatiently on the countertop, while I had my hands full of bedding my colleague in the kitchen, making omelets and toasting bread. From my peripheral vision, I could see him gritting his teeth, his face turning red. Then, when his temper went out of control, he threw the service bell on the floor, stomping it with his feet like a child going off on a tantrum. I'll be right with you, sir. Just a minute. I hollered as I sliced some chicken tenders. A minute? I've been waiting here for hours! He cried out, this time banging on the countertop. Since my colleague was new on the job, she was agitated. So to help mitigate the tension, I said, I got this. I left the kitchen and approached the counter where the customer was still waiting for me. Where the hell are my pancakes? I don't want to see your pancakes! I want my Denny's pancakes! Now! He said, squeezing his hands into a fist. I heaved a troublous sigh, aware he was the type of customer who wouldn't listen to reason. So, remaining in the driver's seat, I replied, I understand how you feel, sir, but right now we still have- I don't have time for your excuses! Just get me what I asked for, or else! He picked up the service bell and threw it at my head, catching the attention of all the other customers. I'd been cussed at multiple times in the past, and honestly, I couldn't blame him for feeling the way he felt. But I didn't bust my chops just to be ridiculed in public and physically assaulted. Did he ever work in a restaurant? And did he ever experience working overtime, constantly exposed to a toxic environment such as this one? He didn't seem to be the type of person who would put himself in other people's shoes. So, unable to contain my agitation, I said, Or else what? I've got 20 other customers who came in before you, and they're all waiting for their orders just like you. So, if you have nothing better to say, you can sit down and wait like a good little boy, or you just leave and find another restaurant. Plain and simple. Everyone was astounded, including my colleague in the kitchen. But not this guy. He was so adamant about his pancakes and Grand Slam special that he threw a fit and began kicking the tables and chairs, yanking the blackout window roller blades until they came off. Sir, if you don't stop doing that, I'm afraid I will have to cancel your order and call the cops. He jerked his head in my direction, and with a malicious grin, he suddenly stopped and sat down as I warned. This allowed me to go back into the kitchen and assist my colleague once more. However, moments later, I heard screaming coming from the dining area. And when I came to check, I saw the creep invading other customers' tables, stealing their salt and pepper, swilling them down like they were some kind of energy drink. Sir, please stop! We don't need you being any more salty than you already are! I said aloud. It was so horrifying that I asked him to stop immediately, to which he replied, 
But I'm so hungry! Then, just when I thought he was done tormenting me with his demented behavior, he began licking off dirty plates from empty tables, stuffing his mouth with leftover bread and meat as he drooled and laughed like a raving lunatic. <laughs> I didn't know how to approach this guy. In fact, I wasn't sure if I wanted to reach out to him in the first place, primarily because of how he gripped the table knife, which made him look intimidating. My worst fear was that he would go on a rampage and take it out on the other customers, causing them physical harm as he did to me earlier. Moments later, I heard the sound of broken glass followed by customers' screams. So, as I sauntered towards the counter, I saw the crazy man sitting in front of some guy trembling in fear. He waved the broken glass dangerously, his smile a devilish grin. I remembered seeing the helpless customer surrender his plate of pancakes and chicken wings. I could hear him quivering while saying, It's okay, you can have it if you want. The creep laughed gaily, pulling the plate and utensils towards him, saying, Don't mind if I do. Then, he dug in without a tinge of reluctance, eating like a wild animal. Inch by inch, the customer sidled until he created some separation between himself and the crazed man and scurried out of the restaurant. I then shouted, Get the hell out of here or I'm calling the cops! Annoyed, the creep set the table napkin on fire, and then he threw the object to the Christmas tree with a flustering grin and said, Merry Christmas! My colleague and I quickly ran over and extinguished the fire, allowing the culprit to escape. All of the customers yelled and ran out amid the fire, and we called the police to track down the psycho. The following day, we explained everything to our employer, and she promised to hire more staff, hoping that this incident would never happen again. However, I still get chills whenever our orders are backed up. Where the hell are my pancakes? I don't want to see your pancakes! This next story was inspired by this bizarre caught-on-camera footage of a possessed lady gone mad, as she is seen terrorizing customers and staff at a local fast food joint. You can clearly see the deranged woman acting out of pocket in this short clip. Here's a dramatized animation of the event. It was another productive day, and while we only had 30 minutes left before closing time, expecting the dining area to be empty, I noticed a woman sitting next to the window. She had long hair, wearing what appeared to be a long nightgown that was colored white, and she was staring at the table. When I saw that her table was clean and a pair of utensils and plates were missing, I was worried that she hadn't gotten her order. So I gradually approached her and asked, I'm sorry to bother you, ma'am, but may I ask if you were able to get your order? She continued looking down at the table, and with her hair down, it was arduous to see her face. So I asked her again, and this time I heard her murmur something in a barely audible tone. <laughs> I'm sorry, but could you please say that again? I clarified, making sure that I remained polite in my approach. However, the strange lady continued to murmur, her voice seemingly softer than before. This time I had to lean in closer, trying to catch her every word, but unfortunately I had no choice but to ask again. Ma'am, could you please speak a teensy bit louder? At that moment, she did not utter a single word. Instead, gazing upon the lady, her eyes had drifted upward towards the ceiling while her jaw dropped open. So, like a character out of a horror film, she gradually stood from her chair, cussing me with incomprehensible words that sounded more like a wicked chant. It was an experience so terrifying that the hair on my back bristled, and as I took a step back, she only became more agitated, banging her fists on the table and jumping over the counter like a rabid animal. I hurried 
married to my husband, who went back to the office to get the car keys. Then, quivering in fear, I said, There's a creepy lady at the front. I think we should call the cops. A creepy lady? He asked as he accompanied me to the dining area. However, peeking through the counter, we were met by a set of broken glasses and plates on the floor. The entrance door left wide open. It was like a typhoon had ravaged the entire dining area. And so, we had no choice but to clean up the mess and request our staff to clock in early the next day to help us finish the job. As a result, we had to open our doors to the customers from noontime onward. As we welcomed people at 12 o'clock noon, all my thoughts about the creepy lady had vanished, and that mattered most were the happy smiles drawn on our customers' faces. After an entire day of engaging with some of the most delightful people, the early afternoon quickly turned to dusk, and the number of customers who were coming in had finally dwindled. Moments later, as I surveyed the dining area, I noticed a woman in a white gown made of cotton chiffon fabric and a pair of rubber shoes which didn't match her overall outfit. But apart from her poor fashion taste, she appeared somewhat lonesome when I noticed that she was talking to herself. There was still much to be done in the kitchen, so I requested one of our staff to see how the lady was doing and inquire about her order. However, it happened so fast, and the lady did something almost unimaginable. Rising from the chair, she assailed my staff with full force, biting her neck and wrapping her arms around her upper body like a predator that had caught its prey. I trembled at the shrilling sound of my staff's voice screaming for help, but I didn't know what I had to do, and all my kitchen staff were in shock. Peeping surreptitiously, I wailed at the sight of blood coating the floor as the woman bit off a portion of my staff's skin, and upon expectorating, she smiled a ghastly grin. Blood painted her lips and teeth, but what bothered me the most was that she appeared to be enjoying it. Somebody do something! There's a crazy woman over there! And she's already hurt one of our staff! I yelled to those in the kitchen. However, the lady in white was dissatisfied with my reaction. So, consequentially, she overturned tables and chairs like an angry hulk, picking up glasses and utensils and dropping them on the floor. As my husband arrived at the scene in an attempt to calm her down, that's when I remembered the creepy woman from last night. I was convinced that this was the same person wreaking havoc in my restaurant, driving away all the other customers except for a couple who were so frightened that they fixated themselves in a corner. And now, the creep's eyes were on them. As the lady drifted towards them, I hollered, Take it easy now. Just leave those two alone, all right? Nobody else has to get hurt. She disparaged, glowering at me. Nobody else has to get hurt? You ain't seen nothing yet. You should all kneel before me. Then she raised her hands to the ceiling, her eyes wandering off as she laughed boisterously like she was possessed. Moments later, she dropped her hands and ceased to guffaw, her piercing eyes slowly turning to the couple. Then she spoke again. Y'all look just as tasty as the hamburgers here. All right, lady, back off! Those two haven't done you any harm, okay? My husband said, attempting to quell her indignation and drive her out of the restaurant. As my husband advanced, the lady ran to the counter, took a knife, and raised her hand for everyone to see. The couple managed to escape. However, for those of us who were left behind, we stood still and prayed for dear life. Who's the master now, huh? No one gives orders to me! She exclaimed, swinging the knife precariously. Then she plunged the knife into a sandwich, striking it over and over to intimidate us. Stabbing you would be just as easy, she said, as she moved towards my husband who grabbed a chair to shield himself. With the adrenaline rushing through his body, my husband hollered like a warrior, pushing her back with the chair. Leave this place! You don't belong here! Ah! Don't tell me what to do! She cried out as she constantly stabbed the chair, to which I said, Someone call 911! Hurry! Please! 
woman suddenly stopped. Then she asked, glancing at me with eerie eyes and a devilish smile. Do you want me to drag you to hell? Seconds later, she sprinted through the front door, spouting nonsense, never to be seen again. When the police arrived, they couldn't identify her, even after seeing the surveillance footage. So, to this day, I imagine her lurking in the dark corners of an alleyway, just waiting to resurface. This next story is an urban legend regarding Victoria's Secret. And no, we're not talking about the store per se. We literally mean the female Victoria and her secret. There are many conspiracies online, speculating what this coveted secret is. But at the end of the day, no one will really know the truth. Of course, with the exception of Victoria herself. Here's a dramatized version of the urban legend. My name is Victoria, and I've worked at a Victoria's Secret outlet for a few years now. I know that's cliche, but that is my legal name. And at the time of starting this job, I thought it would be a neat little icebreaker to get sales going. In reality, I just ended up getting teased about it by my friends and family. They often jokingly ask me, what's your big secret, Victoria? If they only knew the sort of things that I've seen from that little hole in the wall, they would know better than to pry. I usually find myself working the late shift. The mall closes at 10, so I don't get up to close until then. Most nights, by nine o'clock, the mall is already deserted, as very few things other than lingerie stores have reason to be open later than 8. My only nighttime customers are those who find it embarrassing to be seen buying lingerie, or those who are in such a heated rush to get something that embarrassment is at the bottom of their list of concerns. The customers of this story are part of the latter group. I first noticed the woman, a quite attractive woman at first glance, but it quickly became obvious that there was something off about her. She looked terribly depressed, or sleep deprived, or both. I couldn't tell which. She walked into the store without acknowledging me or my greeting. Hi there, welcome to Victoria's Secret. After she flat out ignored me, I let her be for a little while. I was watching the clock, however, as the store was only going to be open for another 20 minutes. So after she took some time and still hadn't picked anything out, I decided to approach her and be a little more pushy. Do you need any help finding anything? Um, no thank you. When she finally turned around to face me, I was taken aback. The dark circles under her eyes were so sunken and chronic that they went all the way around her eyes, giving her the look of a raccoon or a panda. I wondered how much sleep somebody would have to lose to look that way. But then, I thought they might be bruises. Excuse me, ma'am. I don't mean to get in your way, but do you need help? I already said no. I can find everything on my own. No, no. Forget about that. I mean, are you okay? She stared at me with wide, glistening eyes. I thought she might break down right in front of me, but something made her snap out of it. Or rather, snap back into it. Um, actually, I could use a little help with finding some things. I'm looking for bras and g-strings. I'm sure you have them, but I can't seem to find them. Oh, yeah, we have those. The bras are right over there, around this corner, and the g-strings are all the way in the back. Thank you. I didn't move for a few seconds. I had to collect myself as I watched the woman. She grabbed a handful of bras and threw them over her shoulder then sped off to the back of the store and raided the g-string section before slipping away into the fitting room. I wasn't even thinking about the mess she was making. It just didn't seem important. Once I remembered that the store was only going to be open for a little longer, I walked back to the front and found my place behind the register once again. Right away, it seemed that the night was not getting any less strange. A gross, overweight man walked into the store, staring at me the way all creepy men do as they enter. Just his presence was enough to give me chills. He didn't belong in the store. And not because he was a man, but because he looked far too ugly to ever have a woman attracted to him. He was wearing a thin white undershirt, probably quadruple XL, that still didn't fully cover him despite being stretched and worn beyond what is humane for a garment. His greasy body hair spilled out from his chest and the back of the collar, and from underneath the waistline. But despite all that hair, there was very little attached to his head. All the disgusting details and more came into focus as he approached the counter. Good evening, ma'am. Would you kindly show me where you keep your finest lingerie? I internally rolled my eyes. Everything in the store was her finest lingerie. But I figured he was looking for the transparent, lacy stuff. Sure thing. Follow me. I could feel his eyes on me as I led him around the corner. 
This was a common tactic of single men that I was unfortunately familiar with. I stopped at the first big display. Thank you, ma'am. I have expensive taste, so I don't like to waste any time with the budget options. <laughs> I understand that very well. If you don't mind me asking, is there anything in specific that you're looking for? Anything that fits well on thick, voluptuous women like yourself. <laughs> Sir, you'll have to be respectful or I'll have to ask you to leave. Oh no! Whatever will I do if a pretty little woman asks me to leave? Just let me look around on my own if you don't like my company. I bit my tongue and returned to the register. As much as I didn't want this guy anywhere near me, I still didn't want to have to call security and end up staying late to fill out the paperwork that comes with it. There was only 10 minutes to close, and I could handle some basic piggish slaw for 10 minutes. But the night had yet another surprise in store for me. When the strange woman from earlier approached the register, she came with the guy from before. I'd like to buy all of these. All of that plus these, and it's all on me. The creep added a couple items to the existing pile, nearly doubling the total cost. It's common for creeps to try and impress women with big flexes of money since they lack the looks to get any. I raise an eyebrow and question the situation. Excuse me, miss. Do you know this man? The woman didn't even look me in the eye. Her hair was hanging down in front of her face, concealing what I imagine was a shameful expression. Yes? The creep then roughly wrapped his arm around her, pulling her around like a rag doll. Of course she does! She's my daughter! I mean, wife! She's my wife! Excuse me? Don't worry, it was just a little Freudian slip, if you know what I mean. Just a bit of bedroom talk coming out in public. Nothing too weird. Please, just bring us up. With five minutes left until close, I wanted to do the best thing I could for the poor woman. So in the moment, I just avoided making a scene. I couldn't stop myself from the automatic process of getting them checked out. So the pair then walked out of the store, a Victoria's Secret bag in one hand and holding hands in the other. Since then, I've been filled with regret. I've never told anyone about this. It's been my secret. I regret not calling the cops, but I couldn't tell if it was enough for the law to intervene. It eats at me to this day. And at night, I wonder what has become of that woman and the intentions behind all the lingerie. But I can only ponder something awful beyond my imagination. I've always been an avid Disney fan, so I decided to audition for any Disney role available at Disney World. Luckily at the time, the character of Boo from Monsters Incorporated was up for grabs. I felt an instant connection with this character. I knew that I had a chance of getting the role because of my theater education and experience, small facial contours and petite body with a height of 4'7", and adorable anime-like features, which I often used for cosplay back in college. Three days after the audition, I received a call from Disney World, telling me I already got the job. It was a moment of sheer bliss. On my first day of work, I met with two other actors playing the roles of Sully, the giant blue monster whom I would refer to as Kitty, and Mike Wazowski, the little green monster who's Sully's one-eyed best friend. The man playing Mike Wazowski was a funny guy who'd tell us stories about his travels worldwide. Meanwhile, the man playing Kitty was always on point with his character. After our first show on stage, we were assigned to walk along the cobblestone roads of Disney World to greet families and kids, take photos, and interact with the children by giving a few playful scares. Once we finally ended our shift, Mike invited Kitty and I for a couple of drinks. The man playing the role of the green monster was Richard, a guy with a height of 5'5 five five and moderately pigmented brown skin. As we sat in the bar, I was surprised to see the man playing Kitty still wearing his costume. Um, hey, buddy, isn't it uh, hot in there? Richard asked, a bit concerned. Oh, don't worry, Mike. I've never been better. Then he gave us the thumbs up, gazing at the face of the blue monster whose expression was vacant, having a fake smile that matched its dead eyes made it impossible for Richard and I to know what he was thinking about. But Richard didn't seem to mind. He simply shrugged it off and said, All right, whatever floats your boat, dude. Being a former cosplayer, I understood the eccentricities of artists who became attached to their favorite characters, so it didn't bother me at first. However, as the weeks passed, I wondered why I never saw the man behind the blue monster. Even after work, he would still wear the costume, but it only got more bizarre when he would always follow me to the bus station. I attempted to engage in a normal conversation to mitigate the awkward situation. However, it would always end up with him staring at me for a long time or saying something like, Heh, <laughs> that's really funny, boo, but don't stay up too late. Growing kids need more sleep. What was up with this guy? I've met a lot of weird guys in the cosplaying world, 
and I've known a couple of method actors who would fully immerse themselves in their characters to provide a more authentic performance. But none of them were as uncanny as he was. It was like he was in kitty mode 24-7. It was beginning to creep me out. One night after the work shift, I approached Kitty in the dressing room and told him, Hey, can I have a word with you? I sincerely asked. He kneeled down like he was talking to a kid and said, Sure, boo. Anything for my little girl. Look, I understand how much you love James Sullivan, aka Kitty. Trust me, I know the feeling and experience, but maybe you'd like to cut down a little and be more acquainted with reality. I replied, attempting to avoid any aggressive reactions. For the next couple of minutes, he just stared at me. It was extremely unsettling. I was about to turn around and leave, but he grabbed my wrist and said, Boo, I'm sorry. Did Kitty do something to make you angry? I yanked oh. my arm, completely baffled. Uh, let go of me, you freak! The words came out of my mouth without any careful thought. I just want to be with you, Boo. There are other monsters out there who aren't as kind as Mike and I. He then hardened his grip and said, I need to keep you close to protect you from them. My heart pounded as my mind went blank. Then, moments later, we heard the door open. It was Richard in his Mike costume. Seeing that Kitty clutched my wrist, he asked, Uh, Sully, is everything okay? Kitty <gasps> slowly let go of me and said, I need to keep her safe, Mike. You understand, don't you? Yes, big guy, I understand. But she's a big girl now so I'm sure she can handle herself, all right? Richard tried to keep the blue monster from exaggerating even further. Mike, what the hell are you saying? Randall is still out there and he can get his hands on Boo at any time. I need to keep an eye on her. Kitty argued, his voice prominent. No, you don't. Look, I really think we should go to the- Before Richard could finish, Kitty violently slammed him against the locker. I thought you were my best friend, Mike. Why won't you listen to me? Then, he punched the locker an inch away from Richard's face, creating a dent that left Richard and I to our imagination. If that fist had ended on Richard's face, he would have been badly injured. To ease his belligerence, Kitty took a deep breath before banging the door behind him as he left the room. At that moment, I understood how Richard felt. We were silent, confused, afraid. The following day I went to work, ensuring that I was never alone with that creep. From a distance, I saw Kitty conversing with other staff members from the production team. They all seemed to be laughing and enjoying themselves. When I finally reported Kitty to the manager, he thanked me and told me that he and security would look into it. For that, I was extremely grateful. One night, I was relieved to arrive home safely after clocking out. I did my usual routine of having dinner and watching television in my bedroom until I hit the sack. Moments later, I jolted as I woke up to the sound of banging and growling coming from outside my bedroom. My heart throbbed in trepidation as moments later, I could hear the mysterious person say, Open up, boo! It's me, Kitty! Come on, let me in! I grabbed my cell phone and hid in the closet. My eyes were focused on dialing 911 when I suddenly noticed that the banging had ceased. When I looked through the narrow slits of the closet, I saw a large figure standing directly outside. Then, the shutter doors were forcefully open. There you are, Boo! I found you! The next story was inspired by some video footage showcasing a real-time possession caught on camera. It hasn't been known if the video was indeed fact or fiction, but nonetheless, the footage is downright terrifying. You can see a chef acting erratically which definitely falls in the category of kitchen nightmares indeed. Here's an animation based on the occurrence. I've never believed in ghosts or demons, as with a lot of things. Demonic possession seems ridiculous until it happens so close to you that you can no longer play stupid about it. And that's just what happened to me. I worked as a chef at a high-end restaurant until all this occurred. Ever since then, I can't stand to be in a kitchen. All I can see is what happened to an old friend and colleague of mine. I still worry for his family and I don't want to add any more exposure to what they're already dealing with, so I don't feel comfortable using his real name. For that reason, I'll just call him Ben. Ben was a great guy. He was fun to work with and he was a fine chef. He was working on getting promoted to sous chef which is like the culinary second-in-command. 
i just been hired a few months ago, right out of culinary school, and Ben was training me. It was well known between us that my ability to respond to his training would dictate whether or not he got his promotion. The kitchen can be a high-pressure environment, but it's not always like what you see on shows like Hell's Kitchen. We need four creme brulees for a party of eight, and stat, those entrees took too long! Ben and I bonded over our shared hatred for Christopher, the head server. We kept our cool by offloading our frustrations onto him. You think he realizes that constantly recommending the most complicated dishes on the menu is the reason we keep getting backed up? Chris having consideration for anyone but himself? You should know better by now. Working alongside Ben was always an honor. However, things took a turn when Ben was denied the promotion as sous chef. It was like the light in Ben's eyes had been snuffed out, like his soul had been utterly crushed. After a few weeks, we barely spoke anymore. Ben started becoming more psychotic and unpleasant to work with. Why the hell is the meatloaf so damn raw? Don't you know what the hell well done is, you idiot? Stop yelling at me! I was going for medium rare! I can see it bleeding from here! Cook it again or you're fired! I'm sorry, man. I'm trying my- Cook the meatloaf! There were many times like that in which Ben flipped out and screamed at me. All I could do was back away and wait for him to cool off. It was like the Ben we all knew wasn't even there. Like he'd been replaced by some unhinged caricature of Gordon Ramsay. Unfortunately, as time went on, things got even worse before they got better. The boss man needed to schedule two staff members to sanitize the restaurant for a little maintenance since things were looking a bit drafty. No one else wanted to work overtime, so I figured I'd hop on the opportunity as I could use the extra money. But I would have reversed my decision in a heartbeat if I was aware that Ben would be working alongside me. And what made things worse was how it was the night shift, which meant I would be stuck in the restaurant with Ben all alone in the night. I swept the notion under the rug and began vacuuming the floors. Ben was in charge of sanitizing the kitchen while I was in charge of the dining area. I heard strange noises coming from the kitchen. It honestly sounded like Ben was talking with someone. I found this a little alarming as I'd never seen him use a cell phone, let alone any piece of technology. I cautiously approached the kitchen door and peeked through the glass panel. That's when I saw Ben holding a dead fish and having a full-on conversation with it. You poor thing. I have to cook all your little friends and family every day. I bet you miss them, don't you? Don't worry. I won't cook you if you behave like a good little girl. Come on. Show Uncle Ben that you miss him. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. A full-grown man talking to and kissing a raw fish. But what made things more disturbing, as if it wasn't bad enough, was seeing Ben eat the damn thing. He chewed on it while viciously devouring it to shreds. And it wasn't like he was eating sushi. He literally ate the thing straight from the freezer with the scale still on it. I grabbed my bag, left all the cleaning supplies where they were, and got the hell out of there. I ran a couple blocks down till I was far enough to call an Uber to head home. While sitting in the back seat of the car, I couldn't help but tremble in fear as the disturbing imagery in my head wouldn't go away. I texted my boss to let him know that I went home on impulse due to a family emergency. The next day at work, things were surprisingly normal. Ben was behaving normally while cooking up a storm in the kitchen. I didn't see him talking to any dead fish, but still kept a distance from him as I knew he was psychotic. It was a Friday morning. Our brunch specialty is beignets. These little fried pastry balls dusted with powdered sugar. And of course, Ben was put in charge of frying all of them, meaning he'd never be able to walk away from the deep fryer from noon to four. I was working on prepping the dough when I heard the head chef call out. Two more orders of beignets! Come on, Ben, pick up the pace! I could visibly see Ben getting irritated from the look in his eyes. He looked like he didn't even want to be there, like his passion for cooking had gone completely. I kept my eye on him from across the kitchen while I rolled the next batch of beignet balls. Ben continued dropping the beignets into the vat of boiling oil, still with the finesse of a great chef. But when it came time to fish them out with the basket, I could see that his mind was slipping. He was barely pantomiming the action with his wrist. Then things took a turn for the worst. He threw his head back and started convulsing like he was choking. I could see his entire eyeballs blacken. His mouth began to unnaturally stretch wide open, and his whole body began to undulate abnormally. Then, all of a sudden, he plunged his face into the deep fryer. Immediately, there was an explosion of blood and steam. I ran over as quickly as I could and tried to pull him out but somehow he grabbed the side of the deep fryer and was holding himself down. By the time enough people came to help me pull him out, it was too late. His face was irreparably melted and scalded into one huge scab. If he was still alive when we pulled him out, he suffocated within minutes as his nose and mouth were fused shut. I still want to throw up just remembering this stuff. There's been many speculations and forums discussing possible theories regarding Ben's kitchen possession, 
But they weren't there to witness it firsthand the way I did. I quit on the spot, and I've never been able to return to the kitchen since. I cooked it myself. I didn't ask for sushi, I asked for salmon! Um, it does look a little bit rare. I believe the order was for medium- It's raw, not rare, it's completely raw! My apologies, Chef Gordon, it won't happen again. It better not, you wanker!